Members of Council, if you can please take your seats. We can please rise for the national anthem. standing and during this time please remember the following persons who have passed away Frank Luis Rodriguez and Bruno Supa thank you We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas at the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas at the Credit. For, for the benefit of those who are connected to the internet, the city clerk has posted all of the agenda materials for today's meeting at toronto.ca slash council. Members of council, this is a special meeting to consider reports from the community councils, the planning and housing committee, new business and member motions on the main agenda. Under council's procedures, no new business items such as motions without notice may be introduced. This rule cannot be waived. I will now call for a motion to confirm the minutes. Councillor Cressy, you have a motion on the minutes from the last two meetings? I, I do, Speaker, that City Council confirm the minutes of Council from the regular meeting held on January the 29th, 2020, and the special meeting held on February the 19th, 2020, in the form supplied to members. Thank you. All those in favour? Carried. I will now call upon the committee chairs to introduce their reports. The chairs can speak about the reports for up to five minutes. Councillor Bailao, you have a motion to introduce the Planning and Housing Committee report. Thank you, Madam Speaker, that the report from meeting 13 of the Planning and Housing Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. And uh, I believe that Clerks is uh, preparing a supplementary report to be uh, uh, introduced uh, on item uh, PH 3.6, so that should be coming shortly. So I'll just call um, members' attentions for that. Thank you. Councillor Grimes, you have a motion to introduce the Tobacco York Community Council report? Yes, I do, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> At the report from meeting 13 of the Etobicoke York Community Council, this on the agenda of council be presented for consideration. And with that, Madam Speaker, I deliver from uh, one of the, the best bakery in the city of Toronto, San Remo's Donuts, as a promise to my good friend Michael Cole. I know Councillor Holiday and Councillor Ford will agree. Uh, we have many great bakeries in the city of Toronto, but I think they'll agree this is the best, and I challenge any member of council at the next meeting to bring a donut that's better than this. Recorded vote? Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> I think I have a couple of my ward that. Sorry. And Councillor Thompson started his diet today, so it's unfortunate he won't be able to try one of these. <laughs> Madam Speaker, for the record, I don't, I don't believe in diets. I believe in moderation. 
<laughs> Councillor Carroll, you have a motion to introduce the North York Community Council report. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, that the report from meeting number 13 of the North York Community Council listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration, uh, which includes a, a memo from Councillor Robinson uh, congratulating the uh, Agnes McPhail recipients, Paula Davies and Raymond White. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lai, you have a motion to introduce the Scarborough Community Council report. Good morning. Thank you, Speaker. That the report from meeting 13 of the Scarborough Community Council listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Perks, you have a motion to introduce the Toronto and East York Community Council report. Good morning, Speaker. I move that the report from meeting 13 of the Toronto East York Community Council listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Holliday, you have a motion to introduce the new business from the Mayor and City Officials. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That new business from the Mayor and City Officials listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. All those in favour of the motions, recorded vote. Councillor Perks, please. The motion carries unanimously, 18 in favor. Thank you. Are there any declarations of interest? Please indicate the committee, the item or motion number and the nature of the interest. I will now call for petitions. Are there any petitions at this time? Councillor Matlow. Madam Speaker, um, I have a petition. Uh, Meritorian City Council declare homelessness an emergency to prevent more deaths and suffering. This past month, there have been eight reported homeless deaths in the City of Toronto. The City has failed to shelter the most vulnerable. All seven respite centres are full. The two 24-hour women's drop-ins and the Out of the Cold program are over capacity on many nights. The Assessment and Referral Centre on Peter Street is unable to operate as a referral centre as there are insufficient beds in the system. Instead, 50 people sleep in chairs there each night. They are the lucky ones. Hundreds upon hundreds of people are forced to sleep outside due to failed shelter and housing policies. They are in grave danger. Their precarious situation has been exacerbated by the onslaught of an early winter, leaving them completely exposed and vulnerable. A walk through the city confirms what frontline workers are telling us. There have never been this many people sleeping in our streets and our parks before. The number of beds the city plans to bring online will not be sufficient to accommodate those in need. Furthermore, during an extreme cold weather alert, there is only one warming center that sleeps 50 people for the entire city. In order to prevent more deaths and suffering, we request that you enact the City of Toronto Emergency Plan immediately. Uh, there's much more to read, I, will, I won't, but that was the, that was the, uh, uh, the portion uh, that I think makes the point of the petition. And there are 10,000 signatures. Thank you. All those, oh, sorry, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I rise to present a petition uh, signed by 5,000 individuals uh, from the City of Toronto. Um, part of the preamble, the petition was read by, uh, by Councillor Matlow. I will proceed to read um, some of the remaining pieces. Why the City of Toronto Emergency Plan is the only response. The aim of the City of Toronto Emergency Plan is to provide the framework for extraordinary arrangements and measures that can be taken to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the inhabitants of the City of Toronto. It would allow the Mayor to do the following. Make a formal statement declaring that homelessness and the social housing situation are emergency necessitating uh, immediate action. 
request help from the federal and provincial governments for funding and resources necessary to deal with this deadly crisis. Establish an emergency task force with, with relevant departments from the city, including public health, shelter, support, housing administration, emergency management, real estate, parks, forestry, recreation, for the purpose of re resolving issues relating to the crisis. Build a team with all levels of government that will identify vacant buildings owned by the city, federal, and provincial governments that can be used to immediately shelter the hundreds who are homeless. Redeploy staff from various city departments to implement the decisions of the emergency task force and to provide support at respite sites, warming centers, and emergency drop-ins. Invite the Red Cross to assist with emergency respite and warming center operations as they did in the winter of 2017 and 2018. Move the only warming center that currently operates in a hallway at Metro Hall to a more accessible and, and spacious site. Create four to six additional warming centers throughout the city of Toronto that will allow people to easily access them. Improve the safety and health outcomes in all respite centers that have 100 or more people staying in them by reducing capacity by one third. Fast track a fourth sprung structure Implement the recommendations of the Faulkner inquest, including the distribution of survival equipment and supplies, such as sleeping bags, fire retardant uh, blankets, safe, safe heat sources to people who are living outside. Tents must be added to this list. Fund additional outreach teams to distribute these items. Impose a moratorium on evictions of people living in public spaces, including parks, ravines, and encampments. Impose a moratorium on the removal of all encampments, create an emergency rent supplement program to prioritize the housing of vulnerable people, including seniors, those with disabilities. Allow the building team to devise and implement a strategy for the creation of 2,000 permanent shelter beds. Allow the building team to devise and implement a five-year strategy for the building of some transitional supportive and rent gear to housing, social housing. Expropriate buildings left unused and vacant by owners for immediate conversion to RGI social housing, such as single room dwellings or transitional housing. Extend the framework and time around emergency shelters, ex respite centers so that they can operate year round. Create 100 beds to replace those lost when the out of the code program shuts down in April. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Perks. Thank you, Speaker. I have uh, 5,000 petitions. Uh, it's the same petition as Councillor Matlow and Councillor Wong Tam uh, have read. Um, I'm going to continue reading uh, parts of the rest of it. Uh, background. According to Toronto Public <coughs> Health Statistics, there are approximately two homeless deaths a week in, in the City of Toronto. This number is considered low as hospitals do not participate in the information gathering. Eight deaths were recorded over a four-week period, October to November 2019. Currently, there are hundreds and hundreds of people who are forced to sleep outside. Frontline workers have never seen the situation so severe. Tent communities are now popping up in places where they have never been seen before. The city has a seasonal response to homelessness. Beginning in November, it expands the emergency component of the shelter system and then contracts it in the spring. This response does not acknowledge that homelessness is a 365 day a year problem and leaves people on the street for seven months of the year. The city response avoids creating real solutions to homelessness, such as building transitional supportive RGI and social housing and permanent shelters. Over 7,000 men, women and children remain in crowded emergency shelters and overflow motel programs. They are full. Between 700 and 1,000 people are forced to sleep year-round in respite centres and two overnight drop-ins for women. They are full. In the winter, the faith-based and volunteer run out of the cold program provides additional relief with 700 spaces per week. They are full. Only one 24-hour warming centre, 50 cots, located in a hallway at Metro Hall, opens during extreme cold alerts for the entire city. Respite centres and the out of the cold program do not comply with shelter standards. People sleep inches apart in overcrowded facilities. These conditions lead to frequent outbreaks of infectious diseases, lice and bed bugs. The poor conditions, extreme stress and chronic exhaustion experienced in these facilities are causing illness. The city's assessment and referral centre on Peter Street has 50 people a night sleeping in chairs and has turned people away because the system is full. The city is issuing eviction notices to people who are visibly squatting outside. Over 100,000 households 
are on Toronto's centralized waiting list for social housing. The waiting list ranges from 2 to 14 years depending on unit size. Another 14,000 people await supportive housing. Rent evictions rise as landlords take advantage of a 1.1% rental vacancy rate. Research, research shows that 2,000 new shelter beds are required to bring shelter capacity to 90% and end the reliance on overnight drop-ins and respites for basic shelter. This is a human and social welfare disaster. Councillor Carroll. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, uh, I have 10,000 names for the same petition, but uh, uh, before I read the, the part at the bottom of the petition, I just want to take us back to the opening sentence so people realize why we are, we are uh, reading the whole petition. Uh, Councillor Matlow began the speech while we were still settling, and I don't pe think people heard the first sentence. This past month, there have been eight reported homeless deaths in the city of Toronto. To continue where my colleagues left off, the Province of Ontario Emergency Response Plan defines an emergency as a situation of impending or impending situation that constitutes a danger of major proportions that could result in serious harm to persons or substantial damage to property or other health risks. It goes on to say that these situations could threaten public safety, public health, the environment, property, critical infrastructure, and economic stability. It is clear to the petitioners that Toronto's homelessness situation meets several of these criteria. The Government of Canada's Emergency Management Act states a government institution may not respond to a provincial emergency unless the government of the province requests assistance or there is an agreement with the province that requires or permits the assistance. The Shelter Housing Justice Network is an experienced group of frontline workers, health providers, faith groups, advocates, community leaders, and organizations. We believe that homelessness needs to be declared as a state of emergency in the City of Toronto. We have witnessed homelessness increase in recent years, and the municipal response has proved to be totally inadequate. Lives are at stake. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. All those in favor of, of, of approving the, um, receiving the petitions on favor, carry. Members, I will now review the order paper. We have two deferred committee items, T11.9 on alterations to heritage properties, authority to enter into a heritage easement agreement, um, and designation under Part 4, Section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act, 301, 303, 305, 309, 311, 315, and 319 King Street West, to be considered with item CC 16.1. T12.7 on 1151 Queen Street East, zoning amendment, final report. The mayor has not designated any key matters for this meeting. Members of council, as today's meeting is scheduled for one day, I propose that we consider the member's motion run through during the order paper review. I also propose that city council set a time for a closed session if required for later in the meeting. The city clerk has noted the items that members wish to hold. I will now go through the items listed on the order paper to take additional holds, and I will recognize requests to make matters urgent and time specific after I go through the items for additional holds. Once the order paper has been approved by council, any change will need a two thirds vote. Page three. Oh, sorry. Page two. Page two, Councillor Councillor Fletcher. Page two. Yes, thanks so much. Um, on page two, TE twelve point seven, eleven fifty one Queen Street East, zoning amendment final report. There is a supplemental, and I'm going to move that here and uh, thank staff for this as well. Let everyone know that was held up in order to have details for a geothermal at this site, which used to be a Seven Eleven and now it will be a ge geothermal housing site. So I'm going to moving that, what you see on the screen. Okay, thank you. So T12.7, amendment is on the screen. Recorded vote.
Councillor Peruzza, please. The amendment carries unanimously. 22 in favour. Item as amended on favour, carried. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, Madam Speaker, I was heading to page three. But, okay, I'm uh, on page two. Oh, okay, I'll just wait. Councillor Cressy, page two. Uh, thank you, Speaker. On page two, I have item TE 11.9, alterations to heritage properties, author authority to enter into a heritage easement agreement. I just check with the center table. I believe we have the supplementary report with staff recs. So I'm happy to move the supplementary report with staff recommendations on this. Okay, so we'll put it on the screen. Was just the staff. Okay, so on T11.9, we can put it on T11.9. Okay, it's on the screen. On favor, carried. Councillor Cressy. And Speaker, just uh, as you're managing the agenda, this item is also joined with on page 5, CC 16.1, but I will have a confidential amendment on that that's going to be advanced circulated. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Uh, yes, you're still on page 2? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'd like to have a quick release uh, with a uh, motion here on behalf of Councillor Pasternak for PH 13.1 on the plazing. Uh, Planning and Housing Committee. That's not a quick release. That's a slow release. Can I have a slow release? No, it's not a quick release. Well, hold it. Just hold it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's go. Let's go to page three. Let's clear the screen. Page three. That's what I put my name on for. All right. There we are. Page three. Council Wong Tam. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. On page 3, PH 13.6, Intergovernmental Action to Address Housing and Homelessness Issues. I'd like to hold that. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Councillor Perks, page 3. Uh, that was the item. Okay. Let's go to page 4. Page 5. Page five, Councillor Fletcher. Page five. Thirteen point five three. Yes, I'm you holding hold that. It, right? Okay. And I'm also holding thirteen point two one in North York, please, Speaker, on page three. Sorry. They're together. It's the same award, but because it's not yet a citywide award, it's done through two community councils. And then I have a motion for I can do that now if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Okay, yeah. So on, on page on page three, thirteen point two one, and then on, on page five, uh, T thirteen point five three. Correct. Okay. And this there's two motions because it's two different yeah. places and protocol has asked me to move these. That next year is the 100th anniversary of the election of the first woman to the House of Commons, and this award is in her name. So this would be to have um, protocol Agnes in the McPhail. city mark that. Agnes McPhail. Agnes McPhail. Thank you. Okay. Is everyone okay with that? Okay. So we're going back to page three. So that's it. NY 13.21. The amendment is on the screen. Oh, recorded. What? Oh, my mic. The amendment carries unanimously. Twenty-two in favor. Item is amended. On favor, carried. Okay, Councillor Fletcher on page five. T thirteen point five three. Uh, okay, the same motion then, Speaker. Please. Okay, we can put that on the screen. And can we 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 record that one as well, please? You want that recorded? Okay, recorded vote. Okay. 
Cancer Care Janice, please. Cancer Layton. The amendment carries unanimously, 22 in favor. Okay, item is amended, on favor, carried. Any more on page five? Councillor Cressy. Uh, yes, Speaker, I'd like to hold item CC 16.1301 to 319 King Street West. Okay, thank you. Page six. No? Okay. Oh, I thought that was from before. Okay, Councillor Cressy, page six. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Item CC 16.6, 444 to 450 Richmond Street West. Uh, I'd like to hold that down as I have an amendment which is being advanced circulated. Okay, thank you. Want to do that now? Okay. I need to... Put the members' motions on the screen, MM 16.1. Yeah. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the North York Community Council. Two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to Toronto Local Appeal Body hearing and have been deemed urgent. All in favour of waiving referral? All in favour? Carried. On the item on fit, recorded. Councillor Bailao, please. Councillor Wong Tan, please. The motion carries 21 to 1. MM 16.2. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Scarborough Community Council. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to a Toronto local appeal body hearing and has been deemed urgent. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Recorded vote. Councillor Fletcher, please. The motion carries unanimously, 22 in favor. <clears throat> MM 16.3. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the General Government and Licensing Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 16.4. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the North York Community Council. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. This motion relates to a Toronto local appeal body hearing and has been deemed urgent. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. 
Recorded vote. Councillor Cressy, please. Councillor Fletcher, thank you. Councillor Matlow and Councillor Bradford. Councillor Wong Tam, please. The motion carries unanimously, 22 in favor. MM 16.5. Notice if this motion has been given. This motion subject to referral to the Etobicoke York Community Council. So two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried on the item. All in favor? Carry. MM 16.6. Notice if this motion. Notice if this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the General Government and Licensing Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. Did somebody say they wanted a recorded vote? On, no, I just heard it. On favor of the item? Carried. MM 16.7. Notice if this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Executive Committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor? Recorded vote on the referral. Councillor Cressy, please. Councillor Wong Tam, please. Oh, Councillor Wong Tam, your vote, please. The motion to waive referral does not carry. The required two thirds has not been achieved. The vote is 14 to 8. Yeah, that will be referred to committee. Um, MM 16.8. Notice that this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the executive committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. Communications MM 16.81 and MM 16.82 have been submitted on this item. Uh, okay, please, can I have some quiet, please? It, it's hard. Everyone's talking. Um, all in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. MM 16.9. Notice if this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the executive committee. A two thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Huh? Recorded? Recorded vote for the re uh, to waive referral. MM 16.9. I know, somebody's asked for recorded vote. Re recorded vote on the referral, yes. Councillor Peruzza, please. And Councillor Perks, please. The motion to waive referral carries. The vote is 17 to 5. Councillor Matlow? Oh, did, did it pass? Yes. 
passed. So we're voting on the item now. No, so I'd like to hold the item. Okay. The item has been held. MM 16.10. Notice of this motion has been given. This motion is subject to referral to the Economic and Community Develop uh, Development Committee. A two-thirds vote is required to waive referral. All in favor of waiving referral? Carried. On the item, all in favor? Carried. Okay, so that's it for the members' motions. We haven't, we haven't finished. <laughs> okay, um, now I will now consider request to make items urgent and time specific. Count, Councillor Perks, point of privilege. On a point of privilege, I, <clears throat> excuse me, or maybe a point of order. I'm not sure. I need your guidance here. Uh, there's an item which Councillor Wong Tam held on the Planning and Housing Committee. I believe it's item six. Uh, Councillor Bailao at the start of the meeting advised us we will be receiving a supplementary report. It's a rather complex file. Uh, I'm wondering how much time we're going to have to see it before we have to debate it. I don't know where the so, it's but, right there. So should I ask to not be dealt with for at least two hours so I have time to... Like, this is what I need to understand. Okay, so what... No, I might have... It's so, so a significant departure Perks, from the original staff report. Yeah, we're, we are going through time specific now, so why don't you move a motion that we deal with it later? How much later? Make a last, you? last item on the agenda. At the end of the meeting? Yeah. Very good. That's what I'll move. Okay. All in favor? Carried. All right. All those in favor of, d sorry, Councillor Cressy? Uh, speaker, if it's the will of Council, I had those two items advanced circulated, which I'd be happy to deal with now if you'd like. This was, on, if it is the will of committee, I'd be happy to dispense with them. The first item was on page five and the second item was on page six, if you want me to deal with those now. Okay, just, just one sec, let me get, uh... Okay, so we do have uh, the advanced circulation on page 5, CC 16.1301319 King Street. The was just circulated with a confidential report. So, Councillor Cressy, you want to release it? I, I can move, move the... Move it? Yeah, that, that City Council adopt the confidential instructions of staff and the confidential attachment. Okay. On favor? Carried. And, and then the second item, thank you for that, is on page six, item CC 16.6, 4.44 to 450 Richmond Street West. And again, I can move that City Council adopt the confidential instructions to staff in the confidential attachment, which was advanced circulated. On favor, carried. Thank you. Okay, item is amended. On favor, carried. All those in favor of adopting the order paper and all items not held, recorded vote. Councillor Layton, when you're seated. The order paper is adopted unanimously, 22 in favor. Thank you. <clears throat> Members of Council, I want to stress the importance of preparing your motions in advance. The clerk staff are here to help you prepare your motions. In particular, if you intend to move a motion during the release of holds, I will insist that your motion be prepared in advance and given to the clerk. If you do not have your motion ready, I will not recognize you, and I'm also reminding members that you must state your motion first before you speak to it. Okay, on page two, PH 
Uh, sorry, on page 230, PH 13.1, Councillor Cole, you held the item down. Councillor Cole, Councillor Cole, you held the item down. Okay. Yeah. Do you have questions of staff? I this just have a, I just have a motion on behalf of Councillor Pasternak that I want to. Okay. Does anybody have any questions to staff? This is on PH thirteen point one Housing Now, fifty Wilson Heights Boulevard. Any questions? No. Okay, Councillor Cole. So, if you want to present your motion and speak. Yes. Uh, this is on behalf of my esteemed colleague, uh, Councillor Pasternak, my northern neighbor, and uh, he's put forth this motion to basically uh, enhance involvement by the Housing Secretariat, create TO, uh, and uh, also the Parking Authority on this uh, development. So the motion is on the screen. Does anybody have any? Councillor Bylaw, you have your name up there. Is that to ask a question? Your name's there. <laughs> huh? Oh, wrong place. Okay. Councilor Matlow, you have it the wrong place too? No, that's for uh, okay, okay, we're at we're at this number now, PH thirteen point. Do, okay, does anybody have any questions on the motion by Councillor Cole? No? Okay. Councillor Bylaw to speak. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I uh, appreciate uh, the efforts of the local councillor, and I think that number two on this motion to have a housing information session, we can definitely uh, have that. But the other points uh, with related to parking and the layout of the site, we're well into um, uh, the process of this. We're about to announce the bidder. We have contractual uh, obligations. We need to move ahead. Uh, this is, uh, is a good plan, and I ask this council to support the work that was done through staff, through CREATO, and through City Council to move this ahead. So we can move, we, we can uh, move uh, uh, number two, happy to have, I'm sure Housing Secretariat will be happy to have uh, an information session and uh, uh, communicate with the community, but I ask uh, that you take in consideration the work that has been done uh, and the urgent need to get these uh, sites moving and uh, to get this work uh, uh, moving as fast as we can. Are there any further speakers? Okay, so Councillor Perks to speak. To support what Councillor Bailao said, we had extensive uh, information from city staff on this application as well as a number of deputants, and it's very clear that uh, if portions one, three, and I believe four of Councillor Pasternak's motions are adopted, we will create serious problems for the project. The second part of his motion is fine, but I urge members, if you want this project to go forward, do not vote for the balance of, his, of the motion from Councillor Cole on Councillor Pasternak's behalf. Thank, thank you. Councillor Layton. Thank you very much. I won't be supporting the recommendation or the, the amendment coming forward, but this, uh, I will support the staff recommendation. I, I just wanted to rise though, and we are getting 33% affordable housing and I commend staff for drafting the proposal according to, to the city's um, regulations. But you'll remember that there was an opportunity for us to increase that 33% to 50% and it failed in this chamber. And I intend when the bid call happens and it comes back and it demonstrates that we're getting a big fat check for the balance of those lands, I intend to get up and rise and explain how that money could have been better suited to build more affordable housing on this site as it could on all future uh, uh, housing now sites, which is what they do in other cities where they actually require a higher rate of affordable housing when they release their city sites. I think council made a mistake. I will continue to raise it. And I hope when we have another round of sites come forward that we'll fix that mistake. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Fletcher. I just want to uh, note that at committee we did have a quite a debate and discussion and there was people that came from the ward to discuss many things and I think one of the things we should note is 
there's still a site plan and some of the tweaking that they're concerned about for um, stop signs, width of roads, those things should really be discussed in the site plan. We just discussed it and we're passing here a larger vision for the site with details, but there is still time at North York Community Council for residents and the councillor and the other councillors to ensure that everything's lined up with the arterial, et cetera, et cetera, speaker, so. Thank you. So, do we wanna put the, the, the amendment on the screen? I, I can't see it. Okay, so members, do you want the um, the amendment split? So we'll vote on part two first. Part two of the motion carries. The vote is 21 to 1. Oh, I made a mistake. Can we reopen it, please? Yes. Somebody reopen it on favor, carried. Can we, re can we vote again, please? <laughs> it's just that we're going so fast. <laughs> I have a day, too. I haven't had one. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Crawford, please. No, this is on two. Councillor Thompson, please. Councillor Karagiannis. Yeah. Yeah, because we reopened the vote. Remember, I voted incorrectly. We're voting on two. Yes. The revote on part two of the motion carries unanimously. Twenty-two in favor. Okay, on, on the remainder, on favor, recorded. Cancer Care Giannis, please. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Peruzza, your vote, please. The balance of the motion does not carry. The vote is 5 to 17. Okay. Item is amended on favor. Carry. Page two, PH 13.3. Councillor Grimes held the item down. Do we have any questions? It's the official plan review, transportation recommended official plan amendment. Do we have questions? Councillor Grimes? Yes, thank you. Good thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Uh, my question to Mr. Lintern. Uh, this report has caused a, uh, a great deal of concern in my ward. A lot of misinformation has been put out there. Um, are, are they concerned about the proposed change uh, on the map four? Why is Lakeshore West a park lot now being proposed as high order a transit corridor? Uh, through, this, through the speaker, <clears throat> the exercise here with the transportation policies is to update them and to align them with uh, various other policies and plans. So part of that exercise is aligning uh, map four with the big move. The big move does identify Lakeshore Boulevard, Lakeshore Boulevard as uh, a place for higher order transit. So that's the essence of why we updated the maps, not unlike a Jane Street, a Dundas West, a Kingston Road, an Ellesmere. It belongs in that family of possible or potential future transit uh, improvements. So the official plan's updated every five years. So why do we have to make the change now? Uh, through the speaker, this uh, exercise is part of our municipal comprehensive review, which began in 2012. And as uh, council may uh, recall, as, as council may recall, we brought through a series of policies to update comprehensively the official plan. The first phase of the transportation policies was approved by this council a few years ago. This is the second phase. So it's part of the five-year review, and we'll, uh, that's, that's in accordance with the requirements of the Planning Act. Great. So the waterfront transit reset, uh, instead of dedicated right away of Lakeshore Boulevard west of Park Lawn, won't be needed until 20, 2041. Is a dedicated streetcar track being built on Lakeshore in the immediate future west of Park Lawn right now? No, there are no plans. Is there, is there a plan to build one in 2041? Not that I'm aware of, no. Will one ever be built on Lakeshore Boulevard? Uh, I think that's speculation far off into the future, which... Uh, far off in the future. Far off in the future. Right. Uh, at the Committee of Adjustment and T-Lab, developers are using the argument that high order trans transit is justification for increased density in neighborhoods, the lot splitting. Have de developers been lobbying for this change on map four? Uh, my community thinks that the developers have been lobbying for this change. Is, is that correct information? I'm not aware of any lobbying by any developers about changes on map four, no. Will this change in the plan allow for increased densities along Lakeshore Boulevard? Yeah. No, the, the uh, placement of these lines on this map does not confer any density permission. That exercise will be, is associated with a growth plan conformity exercise. We're kicking that exercise off at the Planning and Housing Committee in uh, March with a work program uh, around establishing minimum densities in major transit station areas. That is where transit and density will be linked through those major transit station areas. And uh, that process will take about 18 months, full public process on looking at those minimum densities across the city. Again, associated with stations, Currently, there are only two stations in, in proximity to uh, uh, Lakeshore Boulevard. One is at the Mimico uh, GO station, and the other one is at the Long Branch GO station. Right. So uh, my last question, will this change allow for more lot splitting in Long Branch? I know your office has been very active on this file. It's a big concern to the people of Long Branch. Will this allow for more lot splitting? No. Uh, through the speaker, in my view, as a professional planner, uh, this map change uh, offers no relationship whatsoever to the exercise of lot splitting. Lot splitting is governed by the policies of the official plan and our neighborhood policies specifically. And I know you had a meeting with my constituents the other day. Thank you for that. So in the supplement report, you've kind of addressed some of their issues that they brought up to you personally the other day. Correct? It's in the supplement report. Yes, now? through the speaker, I thought it was uh, important to sit with the residents and hear their specific concerns. I uh, empathize with the concern that these maps and other policies could be misused at the LPAT or the T-Lab. And I think the supplementary report provides the necessary clarification that should assist anybody trying to make the alternate case at the T-Lab. So to be clear, West the Park Lawn, there's no LRT coming today, tomorrow, 2041, in, in, in your professional opinion? Uh, no. In the future? Not, not in the immediate future at all. Those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Lutcher. <laughs> Councillor Holliday, questions. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I noticed in the minutes uh, that there was a piece of wait, the wait. staff recommended official plan removed, uh, and that was the paragraph on automated vehicles. I wondered if the chief planner could offer some comment about what the desired effect was of having some statement or some policy direction towards automated vehicles. And what happens if we have nothing? 
been removed. Uh, so through the speaker, the, uh, the deletion at the committee uh, on automated vehicles was with respect to uh, non-policy text. Uh, the non-policy text in the plan uh, offered, uh, we think, a balanced uh, commentary, if you will, on the advent of automated vehicles. We don't have an automated vehicles uh, strategy yet. That's in development. Uh, so this, this is a commentary, if you will, on automated vehicles, which we felt was just uh, putting in some context in the plan, but not uh, staking out a uh, council policy position on it. Right, but, it, but there's purpose in having the wording. And you know, it talks about new technologies should be incorporated in our transportation system in ways which avoid their drawbacks and support the vision and goals of the city and it's, uh, their drawbacks is the advent of automated vehicles. Is, it, is there not utility in having this language there? I mean, it's better than nothing? Well, it, uh, staff did recommend including right. that policy context. It outlines, we feel, a balanced view of both potential pros and cons of automated vehicles. That will manifest itself more fully in a tactical uh, strategy that uh, is being developed by transportation services. So it has utility to uh, provide that context in a 21st century city, yes. And is it fair to say that, you know, it's still quite early in the advent of automated vehicles, although if you go to any car dealership, you'll find there's more and more automation in the vehicles now. Um, you know, are, are looking to the future, can we expect as a council to, to face making policy on this, trying to figure this out? Um, you know, competition for curb space. And, and would, should we not turn our minds to it in the official plan so that we're beginning to prepare for this and have some preliminary work on uh, dealing with this change that's coming. Uh, so uh, again, and I uh, defer to uh, the general manager of transportation to add in, but uh, at, a, at a general level, the intent of the official plan is to set, a, uh, set the commentary, if you will, uh, for what's coming. It's a long range plan, 30 year vision. Uh, that's non-policy text that was deleted, but it does offer up the commentary for future decision making that council will have to uh, confront. I, okay, thank you. And I noticed also in the official plan language, there was the words public bike share facilities. Why was the word public selected uh, as opposed to just the generic term of bike share facilities? Uh, I believe in, in the use in that section, we, we recognize the the, it's a recognition of the existing uh, bike share provision, Fair publicly enough. provided bike share provision. We certainly see bike share, uh, other kinds of bike share going on, but it's a recognition of the role of the public bike share system. Okay. Uh, I have noticed as well there's, a, there's some discussion of laneways. Laneways are up there in the text. You, you generically, you say the right of way, and then you say streets and laneways. Is it a fair observation that laneways are gathering prominence in the official plan? And can council expect that there'll be some changes in those laneways over time, probably along the lines of investment? Uh, so for the speaker, laneways have certainly are already referenced in the existing official plan. So the, the tweaking of language and the clarity of the language that we put forward in this policy uh, amendment uh, certainly recognizes the utility and the importance of our laneway network for access uh, for uh, the, you know, the, the evolution of the city, if you will. And I guess the last question, there's one here that I've highlighted that I see is very important. It's under item number seven, but it's actually policy 3A. And I'll just read it. It's developing the key elements of the transportation system in a mutually supportive manner which prioritizes walking, cycling, and transit over other passenger transportation modes. Can I just say to put it plainly, if I've interpreted this correctly, that walking, cycling, and transit will then be favored over automobiles uh, when it comes to decisions. And that is a very significant policy direction in this document. Uh, I would say uh, it aligns the policy direction very closely to our transform to, to your goals, our, our work on complete streets, recognizing that we need to move people uh, and prioritizing uh, the, the movement of people and the utility of the complete street framework in a way that maximizes our opportunity to move people. 
Thank you. Okay, that's it for the questions. Uh, to speak, Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm happy to move the uh, supplementary report before us. I do want to thank our Chief Planner, Mr. Lintern, who knows the area very well. He was a director out there uh, back in the day when they did the Long Branch Avenue study. Uh, this report uh, really kind of kicked up a fuss in my ward. And I'm thanks for Greg and his team sitting down with my residents to kind of explain. And in the supplementary report, there's a couple of paragraphs added at the end. I'll just read a couple of lines out of there. The identification of corridors are mapped for as transit corridor expansion elements does not imply anything specific about the nature of timing of transit projects that may be built in the corridors. It goes on to say enhancement in the corridors could take many forms and the details would be sub subject to a comprehensive planning exercise which incorporates public consultation such as transit project assessment process. So with that, four BA sent me letters. Uh, we looked at this years ago. Um, they were uh, fired up about this, so uh, uh, Greg sat down with them, and I think uh, there's some clarification to it. We'll be putting a statement out to our, uh, our residents on this to clarify, but there's a lot of information was put out through our community, causing an uproar, but I do want to thank Greg for the supplementary report, and I'm happy uh, to always, uh, in my ward, to uh, look for a high-order transit. People are screaming for it in our ward with what's happening out there, so with that, uh, I will move the supplementary and move the report. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holliday to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I just wanted to offer some commentary on this. I you know, thank all the folks that worked on this, and I know there's a lot of public consultation that went through that. I'm trying to remember if I was at these specific meetings or ones that also talked about transportation policy, but I listened to what people had to talk about. <clears throat> Pardon me there, and they said a lot of things. Some of it included discussion around congestion, but really the message I wanted to suggest to council members that if you haven't read this document carefully you should pay very close attention to what it says and it is really the grandfather policy that a lot of other things will come out of um, there's some things in here that are interesting i mean it talks about having a fine mesh network of cycling infrastructure dedicated cycling facilities on roads so that every location will have access to one of these facilities within one kilometer that's a pretty fine mesh um, it talks about uh, laneways a little bit and it, it brings them higher in prominence. And this is my um, interpretation of what I'm reading. Um, it talks about uh, the balance between uh, non-automobile versus, non versus automotive transit. And uh, really there's a, there's a lot of good in here, but there's some things that I've taken a very firm policy stance against in the past. Uh, things like King Street, uh, the Bloor Street bike lane. So I'm not going to support this because I took issue with those other items over there and it wouldn't be right to support an overall policy that underpins those type of initiatives. Um, I understand you know, this, is the, this is what we do at council and we have debate on these policies but you know if you're, if you're going to vote on something be consistent on it and uh, when people start to complain about congestion in the ward or why is it that a lane was closed or why did we do this, um, you know you go back to parent policies like this and uh, you know how can you complain about congestion if you support some of the changes that are in here. But I, I definitely want to highlight my concerns over the public bike share facilities. I've taken a very firm stance on that. Um, I have trouble with us getting into the business of providing bike share. And uh, this document uh, underpins that. Not against bike shares in general. I just think there's other models to have it done. But it, it specifically calls out public. And uh, you know I take exception to that. And I also have a lot of concerns okay, about hold, how we hold will up, change hold our- Hold on, Councillor Holliday. Councillor Cole. Councillor Cole, please. Yes, but we're, we, we have a member of council that's speaking. Please. Okay, go ahead. Again, it's just a, a, around the laneways. Um, I know I talked a little bit about it around our policies on laneway housing. And uh, this plan compels us really to put a lot of money and investment into laneways and to change them, to upgrade them. It talks about it, making it pedestrian friendly. Uh, changing it because of the changes going on in the city and I worry about that because we're not collecting development charges on, on some of these housing initiatives and I don't know how we're going to pay for it so you know this this is a visionary or a direction document and you know my message really to council is is pay very close attention to what it says uh, because it will it will spawn other things and other discussions in this chamber thank you madam speaker thank you Councillor Cole, you want to speak on this? Yes. 
Just uh, following up on Councillor Holliday's uh, comments, you know, things are uh, shifting so quickly in the whole area of automation and electrification, uh, you know, of our transportation infrastructure. Uh, and I, I just uh, know it's a daunting task for planning staff to sort of keep up ahead of the curve on this. But uh, certainly uh, as we look, you know, 10, 20 years ahead, as Councillor Grimes is looking ahead for the Lakeshore area, uh, you know, the thing that really uh, we have to consider is we're about to embark on a uh, $30 billion uh, mass transit plan uh, based on uh, 20th century technology. None of it is basically based on uh, the new uh, battery uh, fueled, uh, you know, transit systems that are exploding all over the world. Uh, China's, all of China's buses are now electric. They're all battery operated. Every new bus on the road that comes into Chinese cities is now battery operated. So we are going to spend uh, billions uh, building uh, uh, these uh, mass transit system uh, based on uh, last century's technology. And the same with our bus systems all over uh, the buses we're purchasing. Uh, I know we're starting to purchase more and more uh, electric buses, e-buses. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a whole uh, industry built on uh, basically converting the diesel buses, even some of them that are 20, 30, 40 years old, into e-buses. And so these type of uh, changes are happening because of the incredible uh, technological advances in uh, electrification which is are occurring. So whether it be uh, the uh, electrification of our vehicles or, or of our transportation vehicles, or whether it be uh, just the mobility of people, uh, you know, that we, we still are thinking uh, with 20th century lenses, uh, with a 20th century lens on transportation. And I just wonder how we can uh, incorporate these uh, future trends early enough so that we don't make these massive capital investments, which we are about to embark on, $30 billion going forward with uh, last century's technology. And nobody is raising that question. Do we still have to run our transportation system on you know, rear view mirrors here that we're using uh, in Toronto? So I just want to put that on the record. Okay, so on the item, Councillor Grimes' motion recorded vote. Councillor Ainsley, when you're seated, please. <laughs> Councillor Peruzza, please. <coughs> Councillor Carroll, please. Oh, thank you. The motion carries unanimously, 23 in favor. Okay, uh, item as amended, recorded, item as amended. Side is good. The item is amended carries. The vote is twenty two to one. Okay. Um, if if I can have my, if Councillor. Councillor Peruzza, if, if I can have members of council to please take your seats. 
Um, Councillor Perks. Um, oh. So, Councillor Peruzza. Yeah, speaker, on, on the on the last vote, I, I made a mistake. So, I I, I pushed green, but then I, I immediately realized what I was doing. I was trying to push the no button, the red, but the vote got closed, obviously, and it didn't get captured. I have my good friend here sitting next to me as uh, as uh, as testimony to that. Um, uh, <laughs> so, I. I I would like to respectfully okay, request well, that we reopen okay, that vote. Let me vote. ask, let me uh, ask the please. members. Okay, so, so hold on. So, what Councillor Peruzza is saying that when we voted on PH thirteen point one, which was Councillor Cole's motion for fifty Wilson Heights Boulevard, we voted on two separately, and the remainder of the motion, Councillor Peruzza voted incorrectly. So he wants to reopen that vote. On the remainder. Yes. So, Councillor Perks. Speaker, I will happily move that this council move to correct Councillor Perutz's button mistake. On favor of reopening, just the remainder, not the two, just the remainder. On favor? Carried. So, now we'll vote on the remainder of the motion. Recorded vote, excluding two. Recorded vote. It, I, I did name the uh, item. It's housing now. Wilson? That was unclear. I thought we were reopening the one we just did. No, and that's why Council Perks got up and reopened. So let's be really clear. This is reopening what item? Wilson. PH 13.1, right. which That's we done. voted on previously to That's this right. last one. And Councillor Prudes approached me and said he voted incorrectly, and that's why I made it clear. We're not reopening motion, the, the part two. We're just reopening the remainder of the motion. So we can you just remind me on part two? We well, voted, we're not reopening part two. Oh, I understand. Two. On yeah. part two, we voted and That's we approved right. it. And the rest of the motion right. was uh, negative. Is that and correct? That's, and that's what counts. And you wish to vote here. in the negative and you voted in the positive. I right. get it. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Now I understand. Thank you, Speaker. Yeah. So recorded vote. On the balance. Yes, on the balance. Councillor Cressy, please. We're doing this as a courtesy for Councillor Peruzza, so Councillor Peruzza, thank Councillor Perks. Councillor Fillion, please. The revote <laughs> on parts one, three, and four of the amendment uh, uh, does not carry. The vote is five to 18. Okay. Now we'll go to page page two. Yes. I wish to vote, wish in, the to vote in the appropriate oh. manner, which is in the incorrect way. So I voted yes. That. You voted no here. I voted yes. Oh, you voted yes. Yeah. So you want to vote no. Right? That's correct. Yeah. I'll re move to reopen. Oh, oh dear. My apologies. Uh, my mind was elsewhere. Okay. Can, okay, members, let, let's. Let's just try to understand what we're doing here. Okay, so you voted incorrectly again. So you, no, but now on this motion, so you want to reopen. So I need, uh, yes, on um, favor, carry. Let's make it perfectly clear. We're voting on, let's put the motion back on the screen. And please, we're voting on one, Three and four. Okay? Everyone's okay with that? Recorded vote. And and this will be the last time we're reopening. Councillor Cressy. Yeah. Councillor Cole, please. 
The second revote on parts one, three, and four of the amendment uh, does not carry. The vote is three to twenty. Okay. <laughs> yes, he voted yes the first time. That's why we reopened it. Okay. Okay, let's move on. Councillor Peruta. Please, can I have order? Councillor Peruta. Okay, we're on page. Oh, hold on, hold on. We're on page two, PH 13.4. Councillor Peruta, you held it down. This is on Fir Grove. Uh, grassways revitalization. So, do we have questions to staff? Councillor Fletcher, questions to staff? Uh, yes, uh, this is a question for Mr. Oh. Lintern, our chief planner. And at committee, we had asked you to look at increased density for affordable housing, how to achieve more. Because, it, what is the city's official plan for large sites? Uh, through the speaker, the official plan, if the site is larger than five hectares, seeks 20% of the housing for affordable housing. That's the current uh, large site policy. And five hectares is about 12 acres, for those of us who don't work in hectares, is that right? Plus or minus, yes. <laughs> Plus or minus a few square feet. Um, so a, a large site, five hectares, 12 acres, and this site is 13 and some acres. So it could qualify for the actual official plan, or it might not? Yes, through the speaker, we're actually evaluating that now. The site is uh, bisected by a number of public roads, has some public parks. Uh, that's a matter that is actively under review. Uh, and we're operating in a context, of course, of the committee's direction, which is to achieve as much affordable housing as possible. So whether it's through the large site policy precisely applying, or other means, increases in density and other means, uh, we'll be working hard as a team to uh, to make the most out of it as an affordable housing opportunity. So can you clarify for me if there, let's say I have a 14-acre site in my ward, or, or however many hectares that, that is, and uh, does that official plan policy kick in after all the roads have been designed, or is that because it's 14 acres, you would have to cook in the 20% the, the at the get-go for that. So, so through the speaker, I think we, we have a number of those contextual situations. And I, I believe, and I don't have all of the examples in front of me, that, there, that it requires an interpretation every time as to the site and circumstances of those existing public roads, of potentially new public roads, or alternatively, are we achieving the affordable housing target uh, through other means? So when we've looked at this, for example, in other uh, revite sites, we've, uh, um, we've had to take that into account. I will, I will uh, remind Council that the Auditor General okay. asked a question specifically about this, and her concern at the time was that whether or not we're applying the large site policy, we needed to make sure we were transparent about it so that um, uh, as we are with, with private development in this, much the same way. And that's what we will endeavor to do here. This, this report is not a planning approval report, as you know. Right. So, so we are result. actively looking at that issue, yes. and we will endeavor to be as transparent about it as possible in accordance with the auditor's recommendation. The auditor rec said that uh, on the revite sites that the city's official plan it was very clear to me that we haven't met council, TCHC, everybody who worked on those, didn't meet the city's official plan requirements for the larger sites, which is 20% new. That's what I heard. Yes. And she was quite critical, and I think we approved the policy that we are going to strive to meet that. So if, um, I guess I'm interested in the nuances. If you have a blank slate of 14 acres, mm -hmm. and you come in with that, are you required now to meet 20%? 
Well, again, through the speaker, we will, we will uh, apply the large site policy. And if it qualifies as a large site, in our experience, then we will apply it. Okay. I, I, I'm just not prepared to go it. beyond that, that comment right here. But and that's what you're, one of the, that's one of the lenses that you're using when you're looking here in Absolutely. order to ensure that every site we're maximizing the affordable housing potential Absolutely. of all the city owned or city related owned sites. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Prusa, you held the item down. Do you want to speak? I do. I do, uh, the speaker. I have a motion. Um, uh, which I, I think has been circulated or can be put up on the board. And all this motion does, Speaker, is this, this is, um, um, this site's sort can, of come can on. Can you read your motion? It's right there. Okay, It'll take me 15 minutes to read the motion. No, no, just tell us. Like, oh, I, that's what I was going to do. I was going to tell you what it is. Okay, so basically, uh, this is a site that's come on for redevelopment, unlike Regent Park, unlike Alexandra Park or Lawrence Heights, uh, where a considerable amount of planning, phasing, uh, and work uh, uh, went into those projects, um, uh, you know, as part of their uh, renewal. This one basically has come on because, uh, because the housing is falling down, because some cladding was placed on these, on these homes, and they're not habitable. They're, they're, uh, a number of them have been already sort of shut down, and some of them uh, uh, are, is, continue to have some tenants in them, but they basically should be shut down. They, the project has been kind of fenced off. You have like road and infestation there. Um, about a week ago, the community center burned down um, there. There's a, there's a community center in the middle of it that uh, many of you will have read in the news that, uh, that it went up in flames and it's probably not recoverable in any way uh, or redoable. So, so what this motion does is it, it gives Toronto Community Housing and, uh, and our manager some flexibility in, in starting the process and possibly relocating the remaining residents uh, in, in the project um, a, little, a little sooner. Otherwise, they would have to wait for the bylaw to be enacted and then, at best, you're looking at another year or so or more uh, uh, in that process whereby the residents uh, who are living there, who really want to get on with their lives, uh, then would start to be relocated. Uh, so uh, we have the, the ability to, to sort of give uh, uh, Toronto Community Housing that green light and say, look, uh, when you are ready and when you've when you've completed your cycle of consultations and, uh, and the tenants have indicated where and, and what you might have available to, uh, to be moved to, uh, that this, uh, this motion would give Toronto Community Housing some of that flexibility to allow them to do that. And it's really out of respect for the people that are currently there or that continue to be there, the tenants that continue to be there, uh, that, that I'm doing this, because they are the ones uh, that basically have asked for this. I was at a meeting, uh, I've been at a number of meetings there, but uh, I was there uh, several weeks ago uh, where this issue was raised once again because uh, they're there, they're living under very, very um, uh, untenable conditions, uh, and because of the closure of more than half the project, and because of all the things that are going on there, because of the fences that have been erect, erected that have isolated this, because of the fact that their homes are really un, not very habitable and they're continuing to decay on the understanding that they're going to be rebuilt. So I would hope that people would, um, would support the motion uh, so that Toronto Community Housing uh, will have some of that flexibility uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to move on this uh, uh, and move on the, uh, on the on the renewal um, uh, sooner. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that's it for the speaker. So on the um, amendment by Councillor Peruzza, we can put it on the screen. Recorded vote.
Councillor Bradford, please. The amendment carries unanimously, 22 in favor. Item as amended, all in favor? Carried. Next item, page two, PH 13.5, plan to create supportive housing opportunities. Councillor Cressy, you held the item down. Do we have questions? Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. To our staff from Shelter Support and Housing Administration, how many people use our shelter system each year? How many unique individuals? Uh, to the speaker, uh, we have about 25,000 unique individuals that use the shelter system every year. Okay, so 25,000 people use it every year. And we have spaces on any given night for how many people within the shelter system? Uh, between 8 and 9,000. Between 8 and 9,000. So of the 25,000 people who use our shelter system in any given year, how many stay for less than three months? What percentage-ish? Um, about 80% of our system uh, it is, uses it for less than the definition of chronic homelessness, and about 20 to 23% are uh, defined as chronic uh, homeless people who use the shelter system for more than six months. So eight, around 80% of people use it for less than the period defined as chronic homelessness. What is that period? How many months are we talking about there? Six months. Six months. Okay. So about 80% of the, of the 25,000 people who used our system, about 80% of them we're in the shelter system and out within three months. That is correct. Okay. For that 20%, or I heard you say 23% of what we would define as the chronic homelessness, how long do they stay in the shelter uh, system? So it's defined as more than six months. We have a range uh, of lengths of stay, anywhere from six months, uh, I would say probably up to 10 years with, for some people. Okay. So six months up to 10 years. So in effect, that population that 23% of people, many of whom are living in a shelter, in the shelter system. Uh, that's correct, Councillor, and that's one of the issues that we're trying to address uh, with our Partners in Housing Secretariat is some people are using the shelter system as supportive housing as opposed to an emergency uh, shelter. To which I would ask, is a shelter system suitable to help somebody access the supports needed to exit homelessness, uh, or is supportive housing better situated to do that? Uh, a shelter is uh, best equipped to help people exit a shelter. We have experts both on helping people create a housing plan and create an employment plan and a re-education plan. Um, the types of supports that often people need in supportive housing are not things that are supported within the shelter system. Okay, so for that 23% of people who are, for all intents and purposes, living in the shelter system, our shelter supports cannot get them out of the shelter system. We need supportive housing. That is correct. We okay. can't move them on successfully. If we move them just because it's a physical unit, they end up uh, coming back to us, which is often more detrimental. Okay. On supportive housing, then, what is the waiting list currently for supportive housing in the city? Uh, there's provincially funded mental health uh, housing of uh, waiting lists of about 17,000 people. That's access or is, is That's that right? yes, access. We also, as a service system manager, uh, manage over 10,000 units. However, there's not a single access point uh, to those. It's something that uh, we're working on through coordinated access, but it's uh, really difficult to know. Uh, so do we have, that's in, so the provincial list through access has a waiting list of 17,000 people, but there, that may be, not, that may be demonstrative but not exhaustive of the lead, of the actual need based on what we're looking at in the city. That's correct. Okay. Um, so we have an affordable a supportive housing target in this city of 18,000 units over 10 years. That's correct. That was endorsed in 2018, is that right? Um, yes, uh, I think uh, the recommendation came out of an estimate from the Wellesley Institute um, that took a look at the amount of people they uh, expected would need the support of supportive housing um, and, uh, and council adopted that target. So 18,000 over 10 years. Uh, how many units, 18, so that's 1,800 a year, how many units a year in 2018 and 19 did the city create on its own? Um, we supported about 2,000 people to move into housing from shelter who were chronic homeless, uh, under the definition of chronic homelessness through a provincial program. 
Um, on city funding alone, I don't believe we were able to support uh, anyone. So we supported some through a provincial program. We did not do support any through a city funded program. So the plan in front of us here in response to council direction is for the city to create 600 units this year in 2020. Is that right? That's correct. And, and thus calling on the provincial and federal partners to commit to creating the other two thirds to get us to 1800 a year? That's correct. Okay. Uh, so we have funding for 600 units this year. Is there funding for 600 units to continue with that target in 2021? Has that been projected into the budget? Um, I will ask my uh, uh, friend from the Housing Secretary to comment on the capital. I will identify that we do not have any operating funding for an additional 600 units. Okay, that's your last question. Second part of the answer. Okay. To the speaker, um, we have been asked by council to report back on the funding for 2021 and our aim is to do that through the implementation plan in June to identify how we will find the capital funding for those additional um, how, uh, council investments into supportive housing. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Grimes, question. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, when this item came before committee, we were told a story about a woman in Brampton that was giving money, uh, she was in need of shelter, and Brampton put her in a taxi, paid for her fare, and sent her to Toronto. I heard that rumor, but I asked the committee, is that correct? Uh, to the speaker, uh, yes, we have a number of occasions where we have received uh, people at our 24-hour referral center who have come from healthcare facilities outside the city limits. So our shelters are off the capacity, so it is a problem if our people outside are being sent to our shelters, correct? Uh, that is correct. Should our other municipalities be sharing the responsibility to um, shelter people in need? I know your answer to this, but should other, shelter, other cities and municipalities be looking at helping in this? I think every region in the, in the province is facing an issue with homelessness. Um, I think other, some have been more uh, proactive uh, at creating uh, services in their own jurisdiction. So can we ask the problems to help address the discrepancies in uh, shelter availability to other, other cities? Um, through the um, uh, funding guidelines around the provincial funding that is used for shelters, which is CHIPI, it is up to the region's discretion on how to spend that money. Perhaps if the province were more prescriptive, that might have an influence. So I think we asked the province to come up with a regional a region strategy will be helpful to the City of Toronto, correct? That would be cool. And you've helped me draft a motion which you're supportive, correct? I am, yes. Thank you very much. Those are my questions, Madam Speaker. Thank, thank you. To speak, Councillor Cressy, you held the item down. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I, I do not need to take a full five minutes here. Uh, the situation, as we've talked about many times in this chamber, is one where we have today somewhere between 8,000 8 to 9,000 people who are homeless every single night. And we have many upstream factors that are contributing to that increasing number of homelessness. Period. Upstream factors that we on our own cannot deal with immediately today whether it's the strained rental housing market, uh, as it relates to OW rates at the province, or inequality in gym. We also know, and we've talked about it a lot here, that we are adding 1,000 beds, of which 780 have already been secured and 600 have been opened, to our shelter system to address capacity there. But unless we are providing a pathway out of shelters and out of homelessness, we're not actually solving the issue we should be solving and that is ending chronic homelessness. Our objective here is not to shelter people, to, but to help people get out of shelters, to help end chronic homelessness. Homelessness in and of itself, we cannot end, sadly. We can make it far rarer, brief when it happens, and the city staff tell us all the time not reoccurring, but the situation right now is we have people trapped in the shelter system. We've heard 23% of shelter clients are for all intents and purposes living in the shelter system from anywhere from six months to 10 years. We're not doing enough to help them. We're keeping them in a safe place, but we're not providing them a pathway out of homelessness and into a more dignified way of living. And thus, that's where supportive housing comes in. This is not a magic bullet, bullet to addressing the complicated nature of homelessness, but it is a specific and proven solution to helping to address chronic homelessness. And it's not revolutionary. Edmonton, <clears throat> Hamilton have had great success with this. So, so should we. So we've spent a number of years rolling this rock up a hill. 
In 2018, I moved a motion calling to establish the 18,000 uh, unit target. It was an amendment we moved. That was approved. In 2019, I moved a motion calling on staff to develop a, an, a, a build plan to create supportive housing units. When that didn't come forward, in January, we passed a motion asking staff to come forward with a plan to create 600 units this year, and staff have done that. And so can we do this alone? Absolutely not. We're calling on the other two levels of government to commit one-third, one-third of their share. That's 600 units a year each, just as we've done with TCHC. But as a city, unless we start to recognize that we have a, a responsibility to shelter those who need it, but also provide a pathway out, we're never going to address the real issue here. And I'm delighted and thrilled and pleased to see this report in front of us. I want to commend and thank staff for their hard work. And as we've heard, come 2021 budget time, uh, we need to ensure that the request to maintain the capital, not the operating, but the capital, to keep moving forward is there. Thank you. Th thank you. Councillor Grimes to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a motion you put on the screen. Uh, I do want to thank, okay, I'll talk to the motion first. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, number one, City Council urged the prov provincial government to take immediate action to address the discrepancy and availability of emergency shelter services across the greater Toronto area. Recent results in many people from underserved municipalities creating additional pressure on Toronto's emergency shelter system, including, it goes through A and B, and then number two, City Council requests the provincial government to convene a regional table of municipal service managers in the greater Toronto area with the objective of developing a regional strategy, which I think we, we do need. It was shocking to me to hear the rumor of Brampton sending uh, a, a poor woman that needed help, put her in a cab and sent her down to Toronto. That is hardly um, uh, what should be happening. And uh, as uh, the things that Councillor Cressy just talked about puts more pressure on our shelter systems, I have to tell you that. But I do think that other municipalities should be looking to expand their shelter systems. I've uh, asked staff to help me with this motion, and this should help staff to sit down with the province and address this, uh, this, this, you know, this concern of people sending people to Toronto that need help and uh, shirking their responsibility. So with that, I want to thank staff for that and ask you to support my motion. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam to speak. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank um, uh, both Councillor Cressy and Councillor Bailao for her leadership. Um, uh, it was critically uh, important to have this particular discussion at the Planning and Housing Committee. Um, Councillor Grimes, I want to thank you for, for your uh, recommendation and your, your set of amendments. I, I want to acknowledge that, that staff helped you with that. Um, I think that that is a critical move in the right direction in terms of regional coordination and how do we actually address homelessness, not just only in the, in the boundaries of the city of Toronto, but across the, the regional boundaries, which we clearly have not done a good job of. And we won't be able to do that good job unless we get regional cooperation uh, from other local governments, but also from the province, who has been unfortunately a little bit absent or woefully absent in these, in these discussions. Uh, there are people in our shelters who actually uh, don't necessarily need uh, the wrap around the supports. So I think it's important for us to recognize that it's not necessarily only people who are on the wait list for supportive housing that cannot get to supportive housing. And in order for us to end homelessness, there needs to be perhaps um, an expanded view uh, that it's not necessarily those who are just living uh, with the need for supportive housing or perhaps undiagnosed mental health uh, um, uh, uh, treatments that are that are not getting or perhaps those who are living with addictions. Um, the reality is in the city of Toronto, the cost of housing is so high, it actually creates homelessness in a way that uh, we are experiencing in the shelter system, uh, in the transitional homes, people who are therefore uh, left without adequate supports. So there is a way to, to leverage what I think are incredible strengths in the supportive housing sector. Um, and in, in many ways, they're also the key, I think, to helping us unlock uh, and, and homelessness, because they sit at this particular uh, interesting intersection where they work with both the provincial and federal government. The, res the supports that are required to foster and build up more supportive housing is actually required from both the provincial and federal government. So by strengthening the supportive housing sector, it actually helps us to, to do just that. Um, it's, it's also very important to, to recognize that for those who are actually not necessarily needing supportive housing, what they really need is a, is a more robust and realistic 
housing allowance, a housing benefit that will allow them to tap into uh, the availability of housing that exists in the private markets. And then we need to probably step in as, a, as government or, or the agencies that we fund to ensure that those private landlords are willing to rent to those tenants who just don't make enough money or not are receiving enough money to make those market rents. So there are some low-hanging fruit solutions that I think that we need to pursue with a lot of enthusiasm, but also with the, the type of energy that cannot be ignored by both the federal and provincial government. Um, strengthening the, uh, the supportive housing um, sector is, is critically important. Expanding the number of supportive housing units is critically important, but I would not necessarily uh, say that it's the only thing that needs to be done. And the next item that we're going to debate is probably going to get to the sort of um, the, the root, or at least try to, to get to a political response of, of what we should be doing uh, across the city, across the province, and across the country to address this rampant homelessness that we are now faced with. Thank you very much. Thank you. So on the item, yeah, Councillor Grimes' amendment, recorded vote. Councillor Fillion, please. Councillor Wong Tam, please. Councillor Wong Tam, please. The amendment carries unanimously, 22 in favor. Item is amended on favor, carried. So our next item is on page four, SC 13.19, which is the um, permit parking in Ward uh, 23, Councillor Lai. Do you have questions to staff? Yes, I do, Speaker. Okay. <coughs> okay. So if we can cle uh, clear the screen on the other one, please. Okay, Councillor okay. Lai. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, to staff, through you, when a street has no sign posted, what are the parking rules? To the Speaker, uh, cars may park for uh, no more than three hours. So if the residents do not have sufficient access to off-street parking, what options do they have? Uh, For long-term parking, uh, they would have, uh, through the residential permit parking program, have to uh, apply for and get uh, on-street permit parking to be able to, uh, to park for longer than the three-hour time frame. Thank you. Currently, can constituents in my ward, Ward 23, be offered this option? There, there is currently no, no permit parking in your ward, on-street permit parking. So how can they be exempted from this exclusion so they can have opportunity to demographically, democratically decide what happens on their streets? The uh, availability or allowance of permit parking is uh, a council action that comes through the community council process. And so that is why we are having this conversation today. Every time we change permit parking regulations, it's always brought back to the community council for their, um, their advice. Does it involve a petition? Only city council can amend the bylaw. So, this, so it involves a petition, is that correct? Uh, typically it involves a petition and polling. Okay, so does a petition guarantee the program will be implemented? Uh, a petition does not guarantee the program will be implemented. What other areas of the city is permit parking allowed? Uh, through the speaker, permit parking is allowed uh, in many of the wards in Etobicoke, uh, wards one, two, and three. The downtown wards, um, uh, uh, Ward 8, uh, Ward 6, 15, and Ward 5, and portions of Ward 6. 
So you mentioned it topical. So it's, it's just in all parts of it topical, but only the one that you just mentioned. Is that correct? Uh, the ones that I mentioned. How long has this been in place? Prior to amalgamation. So would you say that the uh, streets in Scarborough are unique to the city? Uh, streets in Scarborough and portions of North York and, and also Ward 7, the new Ward 7, uh, do not ha currently have on-street permit parking. Right? So there's a concern that uh, if there's a concern that a particular home is being utilized as a rooming house, can we exclude that home from on-street parking permits? The, 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 through, through the speaker, we can. Yes or no? We can, yes. Yes. How does that on-street parking bylaw deal with potential addresses that may have rooming houses or similar in nature? Uh, through the speaker, currently the permit parking bylaw allows any resident to apply for a parking permit. However, um, through uh, community council and city council, it can be restricted. Um, so if rooming houses um, are a problem on a street, the area councilor can request that that particular municipal address be removed from the permit parking inventory to ensure that parking permits are not issued. So is it fair to say that uh, on-street parking permit program does not support rooming houses? Through the speaker, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I, I think currently the program, uh, the way it operates, it, 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 it's available to any resident. Uh, of the city, um, regardless of whether it's a rooming house or not. There are concerns with the city's ability to clear the snow from streets with on-street parking permits. So are we able to clear snow from streets with on-street parking? Uh, through the speaker, we are able to clear snow. We are not able to provide windrow clearing services on streets with on-street permit parking. So people that have on-street parking, they are aware that they won't, will not, the windrows will not be In the cleared. current wards, they don't receive that service. But they do get snow clearing and they do get sidewalk clearing. On the current uh, on-street parking permits, what percentage of households have only one permit? Um, through, through the speaker, um, of the permits that are issued, I would say um, less than 2% have more than one permit issued to that municipal address. How many total permit on street parking per permits do we have in the city? Uh, in total, um, we have for each permit term roughly 55,000 uh, regular term permits issued. Okay, what, that, that was your last question. Okay, Sorry. what percentage of the household has more than two to three permits? Okay, that, that's your last question. The, 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 um, of those that have uh, more than one permit, uh, we're looking at nine, 900 uh, roughly of the 55,000 that have, um, um, uh, no, no, my apologies. We, we have three priorities, priority one, two, and three. Priority two are those that have more than one permit, uh, a second vehicle on the street. Um, there are only a handful, I would say under 20, where um, uh, more, than, more than one permit is issued um, to that household. Thank you. So the three. Councillor Carroll, questions? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I see that, that uh, Mr. Lintern is still here, housing staff is here. I may need their help in, in getting to these answers. Um, it's, it's a plan later this year to come back to us on, uh, on rooming houses in the areas where rooming houses are currently illegal, uh, both in the policy context and in the zoning context. Uh, was it planned at that time to address the issue of parking if, those, if, the, if the recommendation is to legalize in those areas where it's currently illegal? Uh, through the speaker, uh, not unlike any other uh, change in zoning or land use, we'll, we will consider uh, all the impacts and among those impacts will be parking. So parking will be part of the analysis, yes. So would it likely that having done the analysis that in that at that time in very short order in a coordinated way we will get recommendations on what to do about parking if in single family dwellings that turn into multi-residential mm -hmm. dwellings? 
in the context of a, of a multi-tenant housing land use and the demand associated with that land use will be provided. Sorry, Master, we're having trouble hearing. Sorry, in answer. The, can, I, can I please have some quiet, quiet voice? Yeah. Councillor Cresty. Sorry, I, I did not hear your most recent answer. Sorry, in the, through the speaker, in the context of that land use, multi-tenant housing land use, okay. we would uh, look at the demand associated with that land use and uh, provide uh, our advice on an appropriate parking standard. Okay, and with respect to uh, um, the current situation, where there are places where permit parking is currently uh, uh, being used in, in the suburbs, is it, uh, uh, is it to do with legacy issues? Or are we doing these as one ofs here and there? Or is it to do with them being more of an urban topography? The, the one that's most familiar to me is, is uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 most, the most western section of Scarborough, most eastern section of the beach. We see permit parking in Scarborough, but it's about the urban design of that area. Is that is that the case in in most of these places, or are we just one oving into permit parking in the suburbs? Uh, through the speaker, I believe that it it really depends on the situation. Uh, typically, the council would approach us uh, after residents have approached them asking. Um, either because of the density situation or because of some other uh, scenarios that they would like to have on street permit parking. So those requests come to us from councillors and we have a couple of options in how we can apply them. Um, and we can, we can make some recommendations about uh, how we apply the, the polling and the permitting piece and then also the second step on through the community council where those get done. Do they get done by zone or do they get done by street? So there's, yes. it's a relatively complicated uh, program. So, Madam Speaker, I have one other major question, and I see that we have legal here. We also have a deputy city manager over the cluster that includes MLS. So my question is this. If we, if we begin to allow, uh, if we, we do this amendment and we start to exclude and allow permit parking on streets, but then, as we've just heard an answer, if you suspect a rooming house, you come into this council chamber to exclude. On a suspicion, we exclude singular houses from that permit parking? Are we heading into a legal difficulty without policy to back us up? Madam Speaker, without having looked into this in any detail, I, I would generally recommend that, that before making that sort of a decision, there be policy analysis. So if this were referred to staff to come back with some policy recommendations or some guidance, would we put ourselves in a better position before proceeding to, to enact this recommendation? That would seem like a prudent course, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Those are my questions. Thank you. Councillor Holliday, question. You need Greg back. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. If I can ask transportation a question first, and then I'll have one for planning. Um, I realize that, <coughs> pardon me, the ward is excluded from being eligible to apply for park at perm on street parking. Have I got that right? That whatever reason the, the bylaw says that this ward is ineligible to apply where other wards would be. Do, do, am I understanding the, the bylaw correctly on that? Through the speaker, yes. The, the council at some point in the past has taken an action to not have permit parking in this ward. Right. Can anyone tell me what the genesis of, the, of that policy is? What is the history? Why is this particular ward ineligible to uh, permit people to go through that process to establish on-street parking? Um, through the speaker. Um, after amalgamation, um, the former cities all had um, permit parking, residential permit parking programs that operated uh, a little bit differently. So the, the rules at that time in 2000 were, um, were harmonized. Uh, reports were taken to all the community councils and um, for feedback on, on what councillors at that time wanted to, to do in those particular areas of the city. Um, some opted. Uh, to come on board with the harmonized permit parking program, and some opted um, uh, to to be excluded. 
Okay, and so was that, was it an arbitrary process that it went through the counselor and for whatever reason they, they opted with whatever wisdom was at the time. There isn't a, a deeper policy or a staff recommendation on this to say, you know, it just doesn't work here so we don't recommend it. Can you help me with some of that history on this? I'm trying to find out why it's not allowed in the ward, whereas in another ward it's perfectly That's allowable. Let it. Uh, why? Back, back at that time, um, um, it, it appears that the areas of the city that had a residential on-street permit parking program simply uh, opted to continue uh, with their on-street programs, uh, uh, albeit in this harmonized fashion, so all the rules were the same. And, and the areas that uh, didn't have it uh, uh, opted uh, not to be included. It seemed to be that that was the trend at that time. And is there any physical characteristic or configuration issue or other factor that would cause concern to create on-street parking where it sounds like it was arbitrarily and I mean that respectfully by the council, it was arbitrarily prohibited in the past. There's no technical reason why it can't be done. It was a, it was a decision of the council, it was a political decision, maybe is what I'm getting at. No, there's no technical reason. Essentially, wherever parking is currently allowed in the city, uh, you, you may uh, also add uh, the overnight on-street parking program. Thank you. Um, my question for planning, it's more of a policy one. Um, the convention that I'm used to in the ward that I represent is generally parking in a residential area is in, on any development application. The principle is, is the parking that is generated by that new pr uh, proposal is handled on site. Um, there's no assumption or look to the city to pick up, pick up the slack on parking or create on street parking. Would this change change the view of planning? So if a development proposal occurred in, in the ward of the councillor where there is no on street parking today and then it was allowed, would planning ever take the position that, you know, you can't squeeze the parking on the site, so our strategy and approval would be to allow on street parking as a way to sustain this development? Did, did we ever have a risk of going in that direction? Uh, through the speaker, I would, I would say generally that what we try to do is uh, provide the parking that is attributable to the demand for that land use on site, on as, site. as you described. I think we, in setting those rates, we take into consideration uh, the availability of transit, the availability of parking and other publicly available parking, if you will. So in a context where there is a lot of publicly available parking, that may influence the way that a, Understood. you know, a parking standard is set. Okay. Um, I know that there are often conflicts, uh, especially in, um, in the core of the city where uh, areas are over permitted and right. new developments are excluded from access to if those. If I can squeeze permits. this in here, do we ever find ourselves in a scenario where we would allow more intensive development or we would allow a builder to not build a parking space because we know that on-street parking is available, where we would otherwise have required it? That was your last question. Uh, through the speaker, generally, no. Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just uh, with the staff, of course. Um, so our permit parking policy across the city is um, kind of quilted together. We have a number of different policies all across the city, Scarborough, Etobicoke, downtown, is that correct? Through the speaker, yes, and they were harmonized. Uh, those places that had existing permit, on-street permit parking were harmonized. And then out in Etobicoke, as I understand that the Etobicoke does have the ability to do permit parking with the petition process and all that. And out of that process, there's not a lot, what, what streets actually have permit parking in Etobicoke? They have the, op the ability to do that, but I'm just curious how many streets would have it. Generally. Um, uh, essentially, in Etobicoke, uh, in Ward uh, uh, 3, you have a collection of streets closer to the lake. Um, everywhere else in Etobicoke, Wards 1 and 2, uh, you have uh, uh, maybe two or three streets in each ward. 
So generally, even though they have the ability for permit parking, there's really not a lot of streets that have opted to do permit Ward parking. Ward 5 is Etobicoke. That, that's, that's, that, that's true. Ward 5 also has a, a number of streets. Okay. Um, and, and then when you're looking at out in Scarborough, uh, my particular ward, Ward 20, actually has, I think there's 15 streets that have the ability to have permit parking. That was left over from the amalgamation. Um, and I'm, I know the answer, and I'm sure you do that. None of the streets that have the ability to have permit parking have actually opted to have that. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Okay. Um, and now this may, I don't know if parking enforcement is here, but I, I know um, Deputy City Manager Cook may be able to answer that. With regard... With, re with regard to parking enforcement and ticketing, out in Scarborough specifically, um, my, it was my understanding that it was for the three-hour parking, and maybe uh, Vince can answer that, it was complaint-based. So you, you would, if you had a complaint from a resident, uh, parking enforcement would come out and chalk and ticket. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So it is also my understanding that out in, out in Scarborough, that that is no longer the case because what is happening, I noticed there were a number of blitzes in Scarborough that weren't complaint based, that parking enforcement were actually going around to selected streets and areas and ticketing regardless of whether or not there is a complaint. Were you aware of that? Uh, through the speaker, yes, I am aware of uh, their pilot to do rotating uh, blitzes, yes. So when you say just a pilot, is this something that is going on for a short period of time and will be evaluated? and decide on the next steps, or is this something that is pretty much going to be happening in Scarborough? And as I understand, it's all actually out in Etobicoke as well. Can you just clarify that? Um, through the speaker, yes. My understanding is that the rotating uh, ticketing of vehicles parked in excess of three hours overnight um, is a pilot that started in, in, in uh, uh, Scarborough. Specifically from where I'm from. That has prompted many, many dozens, if not hundreds, of complaints from residents because they're getting, and sometimes not one, two, three tickets a night and dozens over a period of time. Hence why um, we, some of the councillors, are reacting to the fact that we don't have permit parking because people are looking for answers because they're getting ticketed so much. Wouldn't, is that uh, a correct assumption? Through the speaker, yes, it is. I, I think that there is now pressure on uh, following that rule set uh, that exists with relation to parking overnight in places where it's not currently permitted. And so I would imagine that, that um, those concerns have increased. Okay. And when is this overall report that you're looking at doing coming back to council? We're in the process of pulling it together now. It's going to look more broadly at parking policy citywide. We plan to be back to council by the first quarter of 2021 or sooner if we can get it done sooner. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Karajanis. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. Through you to staff, is this the only ward in the city that you cannot do a poll if you want to have overnight parking? Um, there are um, a few other uh, wards in the city, uh, the northern part of the city, uh, um, nor north, uh, in North York, north of the 401. Uh, there are a few wards and, of course, the wards in Scarborough. So was this something that the local councillor at the time had asked for, that they don't have that ability? My understanding when permit parking was harmonized um, 20 years ago is that this was taken to the respective community councils for those area councillors to decide uh, if they wanted to be part of this uh, harmonized bylaw. So um, it was left totally to the discretion of the councillors at that time. So in Scarborough, is this is the only ward that you cannot have, you could, the constituents do not have the right to do a, a polling, to do a petition for overnight parking. Would I be correct? Through the speaker, uh, 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 wards 21, 24, 22, 23, 25 in Scarborough, but also wards 16, 17, 18, a portion of ward 6 and ward 7, um, in North York uh, also fall into this excluded uh, uh, area definition in the bylaw. So if somebody wants to have parking overnight, they couldn't do a petition. Now, on the reverse side, so if somebody wanted to have parking overnight, if it was on-street parking, uh, permits, they couldn't do a, a petition. Would that be correct? Currently, in the words that I mentioned, uh, right. a petition okay. that would be received we wouldn't be able to act on it because there is no authority in the bylaw to trigger the next process, the next part of the process, which is an official poll of residents of the street. So if you want to have 
no parking overnight. Do you still need to have a petition? Um, my understanding is is that changes in any parking regulation uh, are 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 uh, worked through the area councillor, and in most cases, councillors uh, uh, would want a petition from area residents to indicate what parking regulations they wanted. So in this ward, in order for you to have parking overnight, permit parking overnight, you need a petition, correct? It, it, it. But through the speaker, first you would need to lift the restriction and then you would go through the permit process and then you'd have a polling process. So if you have no parking overnight, do you still need to lift that um, process? It, it, so if a, a ward councillor says, on this street I want no parking overnight, If if there are parking regulations, uh, the speaker, if there are parking regulations in place on a street that conflict with the permit parking proposal, then what normally happens is the petition that is requesting the permit parking will also request uh, an adjustment to other parking regulations. So if it's no parking, the no parking regulation would need to be removed in order to allow the the um, the uh, overnight permit parking to take place. So what I'm trying to get at is if in the old ward you say you cannot have a petition, you cannot change what is there. In order to change it, in this particular ward, do you need a petition? Yes or no, please. Through the speaker, the council would have to take an action to allow the petition and per polling to happen. So if you wanted no permit parking, there would be, there would be no, no action taken because that's what's this case right now in this particular right. ward. Right, so to have no overnight parking in this particular ward, this you would need to go through a petition, correct? You would have to first lift the uh, restriction on on street permit parking. So in this whole piece. ward, because there is a restriction, there should be no areas that have no parking overnight. That, that is correct. And Are you sure? Uh, official Councilor. parking overnight? I don't know every block. No, yeah. I don't know every block. Would you be surprised if I was to mention to you that in this particular ward, there's areas that are no parking overnight? I think that. And if that's so, how did we get there? In, in, yeah. in all wards of the city, you have various uh, restrictions uh, from street to street, block to block. Uh, many of them have no, no restrictions whatsoever. There's no signs what, whatsoever indicating any type of parking prohibition. So it's automatically three hour maximum parking. However, there are many streets in the city that have restrictions during the day. No parking, for example, uh, between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. And, and you also may have streets that have restrictions over uh, uh, for part of the evening or, uh, or night. Yes. Okay, thank you. I don't know what the... Councillor Fletcher. Thank you very much. I'm just going to ask, uh, that's just come back to that. There's a part of the city that has overnight permit parking and the hours can vary from midnight to seven, from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. The hours vary, but it's overnight permit parking where the city collects revenues for the permits. And there's also tickets given out if you are outside of those hours without a permit. Am I correct? That is correct. And then there's a part of the city that has no, for whatever reasons, whatever councillors or whoever decided that that wasn't applying, only has three hour parking at any time of the day or night. Correct? That is correct. And do, I'm going to ask for a report that looks at the number of permits issued in the areas for overnight permit parking, the revenues associated with that, and the ticket revenues associated with transgressions on the permits, which I'm sure is available, not tomorrow, but can be available, correct? I believe that part of that information you're seeking was in, in the budget process, so we can pull that pretty quickly. And then I'm also looking for, I'm sure you can get that from somewhere, Revenue Services or TPS, for the number of households that don't have permit parking, how many tickets are issued for three-hour parking violations? You would have that. Uh, we would have be, you have access to that. To work with our uh, colleagues in parking enforcement yes. to see if we could get that information. And you're aware that there's a large number of uh, people that do park outside of the three hours in different parts of the city, with currently not that much enforcement. That doesn't you're, surprise me. That doesn't surprise you, and that at times I understand councillors have instructed 
parking enforcement not to enforce the three R bylaw. Are you aware of that? That's, aware. that surprise you? I, I am surprised. Are you expecting that TPS, Toronto Police Services, would be enforcing the three hours? And we'll also look at how much revenue comes in from those streets with only three hour limited parking. So I would assume that because of the demand for parking enforcement agents citywide in a variety of locations that this may or may not be, is, is, that's why it's been complaint based in the past. Yeah. Well, let's just have a look. Complaint an based is based on a policy, I believe, that isn't the city's. I, we don't know where that came from. So maybe we can figure that out. And I'm just going to ask legal. I'm going to ask the city solicitor. Thank you. Mayor's office. Um, and when, when we're looking to exclude, would it be discriminatory for somebody to drive up and down streets with a clipboard and say, I think that's a rooming house, exclude that. I think that's a rooming house, exclude that. I think that person did something, exclude that. If we were to have permit parking, um, even in the areas where there is permit parking, there are limited, limited ways that you can exclude a house. Would you agree with me? Madam Speaker, any sort of exclusions or exceptions from a bylaw should be adopted after a careful policy analysis and advice from staff. That's my view. So you're aware that new buildings in the old city can be excluded from parking. 50-story building, either by the parking or you're not on the street. Uh, but do you have concern about going and looking who might be have an MLS infraction of some kind and now moving to exclude them? Do you think that we would be in trouble for that? Well, Madam Speaker, without more, more detail, I, what I can say is that this sounds somewhat arbitrary, what the councillor is describing, and I would have concerns generally about an arbitrary approach. Correct. To so any you, kind you of would like to have a look, and you're aware that any exclusions come through a planning application and come to council as part of that. You are aware of that current process. And um, I would advise that, that uh, fairness and consistency is, uh, is recommended for any. Fairness and consistency. Like okay, thank you very much. Councillor Cole, questions? Uh, yes, uh, staff. Uh, my ward eight, I have three uh, municipalities City of York. North York, Toronto. And uh, so you can imagine the confusing set of, uh, you know, legacy bylaws that exist that the mayor or the speaker passed when she was mayor and uh, all these. And there were good ones in York, by the way. But anyways, so you can imagine the confusion people have. Never mind with parking. So what can we do to uh, make sure we don't proceed in, uh, you know, upsetting all kinds of people who for decades have had certain rules that they're comfortable with when they were part of North York, for instance. How do we deal with that potential threat? Uh, through the speaker, I think uh, as the city solicitor pointed out, part of making any kind of modifications or changes to existing programs, especially those that have been applied maybe in the old cities somewhat inconsistently with the new amalgamated city, um, we, we would want to have a firm policy basis on which to base those changes and we would want to get uh, lots of consultation with the public before we move forward with any modifications and so that would be the reason why we're proposing to do uh, an overarching parking strategy because we know that in addition to curb space issues uh, in the commercial zones which we looked at through our curb space management plan uh, about a year or so ago, there are lots more uh, pressure that's being put on the residential curbside. Uh, we know that we're looking at uh, free floating car share. There's uh, the issues that we're describing here today about more people wanting to be able to have uh, on street space. And so we really do need to take any kind of modifications or changes from a citywide policy perspective. So that's don't, our approach. Don't you think that we should also consider uh, that any changes in overnight parking uh, might uh, encourage more Airbnb all over the city? I mean, I think parking uh, for, for I, don't, I don't know that I would necessarily make uh, those connections. I think that there's any number of reasons why uh, people use the, uh, the, the land use and the, the residences the way they are uh, based on demand, um, and that demand is not necessarily related to the parking entirely. Now, the other thing related to parking and safety is that, uh, you know, with the use of uh, four-way stops and stop signs, 
in the uh, city of York and Toronto, almost every T intersection has four-way stops. North York didn't believe in four-way stops. So you play Russian roulette as you go through intersections in North York. Uh, how can we uh, get some kind of uh, modification of that issue uh, when harmonizing some of these rules about safety? Because right now, again, I've asked for a number of four-way stops, uh, and I've been turned down because they say, well, it doesn't meet the criteria. But every day people are saying, I'm afraid every time I go down Bolingbrook uh, trying to come down and I got these streets, do I stop? Do I not stop? So can we look at some over-encompassing safety-related issues as we harmonize or try to harmonize? Uh, through the speaker, I think that would be something we'd want to look at, especially because I'm sure in the vicinity of four-way stops there's some restriction on keeping the curb space clear a certain distance back from the intersection. I also think there's a communications option there where we can communicate to residents who actually has the right-of-way at an unmarked four-way stop, and I'm not sure we do that consistently in terms of the education piece, which might also be helpful. Yeah, and I, I think you're uh, dreaming, uh, not to be uh, negative, but I'm just saying, you know, education ain't going to work. Is that uh, a question? Yes. Is, I don't, do you think education will really work in this case? I think if, you, if, you, <laughs> if you're persistent on it and you also couple it with other strategies, like traffic calming or signage, then the both work together reasonably well. And if we ever were fortunate to get police enforcement, wouldn't that be wonderful? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Those are the three, right? Engineering, education, and enforcement. Thank those you. are the three. Always enjoy the wouldn't that be wonderful question. Uh, <laughs> the next question, some real questions from Madam Speaker Nunziata. Yeah, it's, and actually, I, it's on permit parking because I believe that that's what we were, were talking about, correct? That okay. is. That's where All we are. All right. Okay. So let's get to permit parking. Now, to staff. So prior to amalgamation, uh, the municipality, City of York, North York, and all the former municipalities. Um, for example, uh, North York didn't have parking on, uh, on their streets, because uh, I know I represent part of North York as well. But in some of the older municipalities like York, um, I think uh, because it's the older part of the city and um, that most of the homes are small homes, they don't have driveways, and they have nowhere to park. So we have a lot of permit parking. We have a lot of permit parking, we have a lot of front yard parking, because there is no accessibility to park your car. So what the process has always been um, is that if you get a petition with the residents on the street, submit it in and do a poll. If you get the majority of residents that want permit parking, you implement permit parking. If there's no signage, three hour parking. Otherwise, indicated overnight parking, two-hour parking, or whatever the case. Am I not correct? That's the way it is? Through the speaker, that's correct. Okay. And so we amalgamated, when we amalgamated, we, we, we amalgamated the bylaws because each municipality had different challenges, right? Correct. North York is fine. They have big homes, big uh, private driveways. They have room to park their car. But in the older part of the city, is small homes, no driveways, no place to park, no laneways. That's why we had the bylaw where we, uh, where we permitted front yard parking and permit parking. Am I correct? That, that makes sense to me. OK. So there's nothing wrong with Scarborough wanting to get permit parking on their street if there's a need for it because there's nowhere to park, to go through the same process that we've done in other municipalities. Uh, that's the reason why this report is exactly today. so so we're just doing what other municipal what other uh, uh, residents do in the city of Toronto we're not change we're not doing anything different uh, uh, I also think the issue yeah. of not being able to go out for petition and polling is unique to certain wards in the city of which uh, Councillor lies war is ward is one and so if uh, this report should move forward then they would be allowed to go through the process that right and go other, through the process yeah. and that's a fair process and other residents in the city go through that process and, and it's only fair that residents in in Scarborough uh, go through the same process that, that has been the city's process right thank you process, process, process. thank you um, uh, Councillor Nunzi Ada uh, those are all the questions to speak Councillor Lai Oh, Thank you, Speaker. I have a motion, please. 
Okay, we can put the motion on the screen. This motion is worded a little bit differently from, uh, uh, is, this is worded by the clerk, and the other one, uh, the one on Scarborough Council was done by legal. So basically, uh, this motion well, uh, is on the screen now. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, transportation staff who have assisted with this file, especially Mike Crude and uh, Vince Lofretti. And this, no, uh, this motion is not to allow on-street parking as a right to every street in my ward. The intention is to allow residents of my ward to petition the city and transportation staff to determine if there's any merit for uh, on-street permit parking on a particular street and for the following reasons. Number one, Scarborough North, my ward has been always been, the, it is about transit. We have inadequate access to transit, especially in the very northern part of Scarborough and the, the old Ward uh, 42. And I understand that uh, the previous councillor, Raymond Cho, has tried to, uh, to help the residents over there, the northeastern part of Scarborough, uh, to get uh, per uh, permit parking, but uh, he failed to do that. And the other thing is that because of the, uh, the increase of the fine for the ticket is from $15 to $30, and uh, people just cannot afford it. And from people in the north, they need to drive to work, and they, they need to make a living using, you know, because of their lack of transit. And also and on another site that I have is the Habitat for Humanity site, because it's affordable housing. They do, sometimes they have a big family, and they have more than maybe two cars, and uh, they are eating up about $30 per ticket per night on the affordable housing site, and it's really, I'm, I'm really feeling for some of those uh, uh, constituents in my ward. And number two is that we are a changing city in Toronto. Any opportunity to create more housing is encouraged, such as the uh, laneway housing, accessory housing, uh, accessory apartments. So by supporting this motion, you're, not, you're simply giving my community the opportunity to allow transportation staff to review the particular street, whether or not they have merit for on-street parking. And this is just, I believe, a proactive approach to support the sustainable change in our big city. So I hope uh, that uh, I would have enough support for this motion going forward. Thank you. Thank you. We do have some questions. Two minutes clarification of the motion. Councillor Carroll. Yes, just to clarify. So this is a simplified version. You're, you're replacing what's on the agenda with this motion? Uh, so they came with our recommendation, that one. OK. So, so this is this is the motion which is which, which is, is board specific. For so, if I can ask, just to be clear, uh, as you move that motion, what is your understanding of what you will will uh, have the ability to do if you create a street with permit parking on it, and you suspect a uh, a rooming house on that street? Well, I have no intention of excluding anything, but because the staff told me that if we have that kind of a concern, we can exclude them. But it doesn't mean that we cannot really, you know, establish a policy for that. But I really needed it very badly because the previous councillor Cho has tried in the last almost 10 years to get uh, permit parking for his ward, which is in the mo most northeastern part of Toronto. And I think it's just a, a matter of being equal. And uh, I mean, I think we do have a, we learn a lot from this debate, but that's not my in intention to exclude any, any rooming house at this point in time. We just wanted to get it, to get the process going. Your motion gives effect to that. But we just okay. wanted to kick in the process for the polling and for the petition, and that's it. Okay, I'm clear. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Karajanis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you to the, uh, to the member. In this, in this motion you're presenting, you're not signifying, you're not signaling that you're supporting rooming houses. No. I'm not supporting rooming houses. Thank you. Councillor Carroll to speak. Yes, Madam Speaker, even though we're, we have a, a basic simplified motion here, I'm still going to move my motion that City Council refer the item 
to the Deputy City Manager, Infrastructure and Development Services for further consideration. Now, I know it is coming back, Madam Speaker, because we've already heard staff tell us that they're, the way they prefer to proceed with this is to do it as part of the parking review that is coming back. There are other considerations in multiple divisions, which is why I'm, I'm recommending the Deputy City Manager. What I'm hoping to do, Madam Speaker, is to keep this alive. Not to kill it, but to keep it alive and achieve the success that Councillor Cho was unable to. But unfortunately, the way this is before us now is exactly the way he tried to do it multiple times. And we need the policy protection to go with. We can't say later you can create policy. There's an old rule of thumb. You may have the best of intentions as you create a change in this chamber, but never create an ability or a policy that would not be used in exactly the same way in every other councillor's hands for, for the rest of eternity. If you don't know how another might use it, be very careful before you make the change. And so what I would love to see is that the deputy city manager make sure that the lens of the overall parking review to do with the suburb, suburbs uh, uh, in particular, the lens of how this does, in fact, uh, lead to, as we come forward later this year with the rooming house recommendations, both in a policy sense and a zoning sense, there are going to be considerations there of, if we license, how do we deal with the parking? All of those things are coming in very short order. And so I want success for Councillor Lai's uh, uh, need. I have the same request from time to time in my own ward. I'd like to be able to grant it. But I, I don't want to do so without, uh, without having the backing of policy, the, the, the uh, uh, solid uh, uh, comfort level of the city solicitor and the bylaw enforcement officers. We need to know that those things are in place. Because if we're, if we're going down the road to uh, licensing multi-tenant in our area, we haven't even decided where and where not. Uh, and, and what the impact of that is on street parking, I'm concerned that in another's hands, we'll, we'll uh, grant the request that residents come forward with from time to time in the suburbs looking for, uh, looking for permit parking by block. But in the wrong sets of hands, the aftermath of that, based on the answers of staff, are councillors or whomever in the resident marching around with a clipboard and deciding they suspect they're looking at a multi-tenant house and you're excluded right now. We heard that, 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 that we could be giving effect to that. And I, th I think we know what that means. Suspicions come in all shapes and sizes. They're not necessarily backed by law. So let's let staff put that language and comfort level in place and then we will be able to satisfy Councillor Lai's needs with no concerns. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. We do have a question for you, Councillor Wong Tan, three minutes of clarification. Uh, yes, thank you very much, and thank you for tabling the motion. I just want to understand, um, when do you anticipate the, uh, the staff to come back after they've reviewed the, uh, uh, the motion? Well, I think I heard staff say either the third or fourth quarter, uh, 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 oh, first quarter 2021. First quarter of 2021, and is yeah. there a reason why it can't the, be done? And the other, the other piece is the rooming house policy and zoning later this year. And and is there is there a particular reason why it can't be done sooner? Because I think if to, the, this it sounds to me this is a long-standing issue going back to the days of of Councillor Cho, um, and Councillor Lai has inherited a, a challenge that she's trying to remedy in her community. Um, and staff should, I imagine, have a have a body of knowledge, subject matter expertise on this matter, can you not bring this back sooner? Well, uh, Councillor Cho tried to do it in exactly the same way that, that, that the current councillor is trying to do it. And for those of us who have uh, suburban jurisdictions, doing that on the floor and without uh, embedding the policy we need to protect those who might get caught up in, in certain judgments or caught up in a struggle around a poll, we, we need a little policy around this. And if, if you don't mind my saying, the clarification that is needed is needed for all councillors. Because uh, like it or not, 
we, we're in a very different place than you are. The planning uh, process by which you do exclusion in the downtown core sounds great to me, but the answers I heard from staff are that that might not happen in the suburbs. And so I don't think all of our residents would be treated as fairly as your residents are currently being treated if we rush this. I think the, my, my question is, let me just rephrase it. Um, would you be agreeable to amending your motion to have an earlier report back, considering the length of time this issue has been circling about uh, for this particular local community, and, and the desire of the local councillor to try to act on behalf of her constituents more quickly? Well, based on the and, and, I, and I could I could probably make a recommendation is perhaps have it come back in June or or May, um, but but not necessarily the first the first quarter of 2021. That takes a whole year. So I would think, you would you agree to that as a friendly amendment? I wouldn't see that as friendly. I prefer to leave that in the hands of the deputy city manager that I'm referring this to. She's hearing your sense of urgency. She's also hearing concerns. She, like me, heard the answers of all the staff, all of them of her division, and she heard the answers of the city solicitor. And so I think that she will bring it back as quickly as she can, but I, I prefer to leave exactly when it's coming back because all of those divisions and the reports they're bringing forward later this year or in that first quarter are, are intertwined in this issue in, in our area of town. I prefer to leave it up to her as how soon she can get it back here. Thank, I wouldn't see you. your date as being friendly. Okay, th thank you. Uh, clarification of the motion, Councillor Kerjianis. Yes, Madam Speaker, uh, through you to the member, our colleague is putting forward a motion that she wants to have for uh, the uh, uh, on-street parking her work dealt with. I'm just wondering, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to kibosh her wish? No, I think if you were listening, I was what listening. I said earlier, no. I want, unlike past attempts by Councillor Cho, I want Councillor Lai's need in her community to succeed this time. And what it needs to be successful and successfully implemented is a little policy backing that gives staff the comfort to do the implementation. You, That's what I want for Councillor Lai, success. Are you trying and, to say that she doesn't know what she's doing? No, Councillor, please, motion? please. Uh, Madam Speaker, that she does I want to thank you for interjecting, because I don't think that, that Councillor that Councillor Kerjiana said is not what Councillor Carroll is saying, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker, I know what she's saying. Okay, Councillor, no, no, we're gonna be speaking on the referral now. Yes, two minutes, Councillor Perks. Thank you. As much as I understand the concerns that Councillor Carroll is raising, I would like to speak against referring this right now. We, uh, it's this, for some reason, seems to be the term of permit parking. Councillor Bradford took a particular strategy. Councillor Matlow took another. I took a third one. Councillor Lai is taking a fourth one. Yes, there are a lot of issues as the city is growing by 50,000 people a year in terms of where people store their cars, and different neighborhoods want to deal with it differently. In, each, in, the, in the instance when my issue came, some people said, why don't we defer it until after the staff report in 2021 on the curbside management strategy? So I did a little bit of work to figure out what's involved in the curbside management strategy. Some of the issues are how we manage deliveries, how we manage access for emergency vehicles, how we manage snow removal, how we manage garbage pickup, what we do about windrows, what we do about leaf pickup, Car sharing, which is now de dealt with in very distinctly different ways throughout the city. Land use issues, putting the line around condominium buildings when they go into areas where there is currently a shortage of permit parking. Land use issues in terms of multi-tenant buildings that will be coming in. And on and on and on. If you believe that city staff are going to write a report in a year that solves all of those problems to all of our satisfaction, you are dreamers. They will not have a solution to how we manage all of those problems that will easily fly through council and find some kind of consensus within a year. It won't happen. So if you tie what Councillor Lai is trying to do to that process, you are essentially saying, remember Raymond Cho couldn't do it? Ten years from now, someone will say, remember how Cynthia Lai couldn't do it? You're dooming this effort to the dustbin. Thank you.
Okay, two minutes on the referral, Councillor Matlow. Um, I'm uh, speaking against uh, referral, and uh, you know, Councillor Perks and I had fundamental disagreements about um, what his wishes were in his ward. Uh, I had different wishes for my ward. And I may not have actually spoken against defer referral uh, uh, before that debate, but Council has actually set some precedent where, as Councillor Perks uh, referred to, where we have established that there are going to be some very, a variety of rules based on what local councillors believe they are doing to reflect the wishes of their communities. That's what Councillor Lai is doing. And it would be un fundamentally unfair if everybody else, on behalf of their community, as duly elected representatives in a representative democracy, are able to do, uh, uh, you know, establish uh, uh, rules uh, to address permit parking and other matters, as Councillor Perks alluded to, uh, that, that Councillor Lai uh, should be uh, uh, excluded from being able to do that for her residents. Now, when, uh, when our staff come back with their full report, then perhaps we're going to be able to establish some rules that have better oversight over the entire city. And I look forward to reading that report, and I think that report is going to be valuable. And I wish we hadn't done all these different things before they had an opportunity to provide the report. But that's already done. That's all, we've already been making decisions. And again, I just want to reiterate how absolutely unfair it would be to Councillor Lai and her residents if she, is, she and her residents are excluded from the opportunity to address their priorities while other wards have been able to. That's wrong, and I would f just strongly disagree with taking that, that Thank direction. you. Councillor Karagiannis, on the referral. Madam Come Speaker, in. there's a word that's called democracy. Unfortunately, sometimes that's not something that we prevail. To defer this item, that would mean that democracy in Ward 23, Councillor Lai's area, will not have an opportunity to speak. Those constituents are speaking through their councillor. I might have fundamental differences with her councillor on this particular item. However, this is her wish. She's bringing it forward. And for us to defer it, that's deflecting. And this is something that I've seen many a times done in this uh, council chamber by uh, said member, always deflecting, always sending it elsewhere that's not supposed to be. I'm not supporting that, and I urge everybody not to defer it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. So on the referral, recorded vote. Councillor Bradford, please. The motion to refer the item does not carry. The vote is 2 to 18. Okay, on the motion by Councillor Lai, recorded vote. Oh, Councillor Crawford to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Now that the um, referral lost, I would like to move a motion myself. And it's, in essence, giving my ward the ability for uh, Councillor Lai's, um, uh, my ward to have the same exclusion. I recognize the challenges that Councillor Lai has been facing because, in fact, my ward, and, and I think a number of the wards in Scarborough face the same challenge with regard to uh, permit parking. I have the, um, I guess, fortunate luxury in my ward to have about 15 streets that have been excluded already and have the ability to actually decide whether or not they want permit parking. I've gone through the process with a couple of those streets, and when they've gone through the process, weighed the pros and cons out, they actually decided that they didn't want permit parking. And that, in fact, the answer was, we don't feel that that's the best answer for the challenges they're having on the street. Challenge, of course, is they have the ability to do that, and the residents made the decision. Uh, and I supported that decision. I mean, so I'm, I'm not here arguing that I think permit parking is the right answer. In fact, I'm pretty confident that when they go through the process, they may realize it's not the right answer. But the challenge is, is a lot, and I'm looking at some of the streets in my ward, two streets over, they don't have the ability to do that. So they come to my office going, well, I'm getting ticketed, I'm getting ticketed. Why don't we have that opportunity? So I think what Council Lai is doing is suggesting that, and yes, a report is coming in 2021, but these are real challenges that her residents and my residents are facing. Um, so I do support that, hence why I'm, I'm moving this for my particular ward. And here's the challenge. This, is, this, this has generally been, and I think out in Scarborough, generally been a policy which is 
three hour, three hour parking, but it's complaint based. Seems to work 90% of the time. Um, and, but there are some streets that, you know, you, if you, a complaint comes in, and, and these are the uh, people who would complain night after night, they do get tickets. Uh, the challenge has been happening, as staff pointed out, that it's no longer a, just a complaint based process out in Scarborough, that in fact what is happening now is parking enforcement are going out and just not necessarily targeting, but going through certain areas and tagging regardless of whether or not there's been a complaint. And that has been the challenge. I mean, when you're looking at the complaints I've received, and I think they started in Scarborough, my particular area, we were getting, um, people were getting one, two, sometimes three tickets a night. They were getting a dozen tickets a week. And they had no option. They had nothing they could do other than to pay them. And I mean, yes, they went from 15 to 30. But the challenge is, and, and, and one particular individual contacted my office, living on a street that had, most of the houses have one, car parking, maybe two, but there are three or four houses on that street that have no parking. It's an older older uh, area. And she's beside herself on what to do. She's getting ticket after ticket after ticket, and there's no option for her. So all I want to be able to do is to be able to say, and this, it'll be, the street will have to do this. They'll go out and they'll have to do the petition. They'll have to come back, do the polling, and have that opportunity. I think that's the only thing the council lies asking for. That's what I'm asking for. Um, and I have a feeling when the report comes back in 2021, they'll probably say, as it is in Etobicoke, we will allow all streets to go through a process to determine permit parking. I can't, I can't say what staff will bring back, but because Etobicoke already has that, North York not so much, I think that's when, where the compromise of the balance will end up being. So what I'm suggesting and asking is council support. Council I and I have the ability to have permit parking if the residents so choose. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. I just want to uh, say I support permit parking. I support permit parking everywhere. These are the city owned. Oh, I'm moving a motion. Thank you. There it is. Sorry. Thank you very much, clerks, for reminding me. I'd like to know just generally the number of on-street permit parking that we have, the number of households, the revenues that are coming from those areas, and then the number not covered by the permit parking and also that associated revenue because there are a lot of three-hour parking that goes on in the city um, that is not enforced, whereas I think anybody who has permit parking knows that it's heavily enforced and it's not complaint-based if you're enforcing permit parking. It's simply driving around and catching people in areas, whereas three hours, we all know, and I know this from you, Councillor Crawford, and from previous councillors, one side has permit parking and the other doesn't, and rarely were those folks getting ticketed. So they are now being ticketed under our bylaw of three hours. That's the bylaw. Operationally, it was complaint-based, but that's really not fair, because it's not complaint-based in permit parking areas. That's the first thing. I really support permit parking. I think it's really important and it is an issue of fairness. I voted for the deferral because I was concerned in the questioning that somebody will go around streets and say, well, there's a rooming house, take them off, take them off casually. The only exclusions that we have in the permit parking areas are where there's introducing new uses, new residential uses with 80 or 90 people moving in there and many of these buildings. So I'm quite concerned that that might not be used judiciously. Councillor Lai says she's not planning on that, but those were many of her questions. I will support it, but I think we need to come back further and make sure that element of fairness, that that comes to this city council, the same as any exclusion comes to this city council. I also just want to say that um, the issue of, of the three hour parking and what Councillor Crawford, what you said, that doesn't work. I'm going to tell you why. Because the 20 people that have a driveway are not going to poll in favor of permit parking. And that's been my experience in East York that you've got three people, they have nowhere to park, but it's the people on the street that say you can or cannot park on the city's, city's road. And that becomes a war at that time, and I don't wish this on you, but if you're trying to put that in there, we need to have other ways to do it, which is why we passed the motions for our bylaw that we can jump over the polling 
If there's a need for that, that can happen on those streets. So I'm just advising you that that is not a quick fix. And uh, people that have nowhere to park and are getting ticket after ticket, it's unfair that they don't have access to the street. And in our wards, people have access for handicapped parking, for disabled parking. It goes in and out, depends on elderly, people in wheelchairs, they need special accommodation. They can have it. They should have that in, in Scarborough and North York as well if they're folks that don't have a driveway and they need an accommodation. These policies are from the 1950s. We need to update how we're viewing things around transportation period across the city and I really am happy that this has been introduced and that councillors are interested in it. I just want it to be fair for every resident in the City of Toronto, for our streets. Thank you. We do um, have a question by Councillor Matlow. Great. Councillor Matlow, clarification? Yeah. Um, more of a process question. If Staff are, staff are working on, on the, the report, and their report, to my knowledge, doesn't jive with the timing of your request for this information to go to a standing committee. Why would we want to have yet another debate on, like a, a separate debate on the questions that you're asking when we're going to be receiving their report at another time at committee? Thank you for that excellent question. And really, it's so we can be thinking ahead about what that report looks like. like. We're going to see revenues. This is about the city budget. It's how much money there we're maybe missing, how much money we're getting. And I simply would like to be informed no. prior to that so it's not all one big dump of information, Councillor, and that's why I've moved it in this way. Then would you, would you accept perhaps uh, a, a, either a friendly amendment or just a replacement motion that rather than this coming to then ignite another debate over permit parking but, without the relevant information from staff, that we, that we simply just ask them for a briefing note or just, just the information to be provided to councillors? Like, to have this as another item on another agenda. Well, it can be an information to... report if you'd like. It's not, not actually... But not to go to another committee meeting. Well, I actually think it needs to be put forward, and I am i don't think it's going to be a big debate. It's just, here's the, here's the lay of the land, and then when this can be moved into that further discussion so we all know what's going on. Um, thank that you. That is why I don't consider this a big debate. Thank, unless thank you want you. to make it a big debate, it's just some information okay. that is helpful to it's have. It's just that I'm running out of time here. Um, so it's almost 12.30, so what is the wish of council? Do we want to finish this item or finish the item or finish the agenda? Pardon? We, we have, we, after this, we have three items. Which one? Okay, hold on, hold on, let me respond. Councillor Fletcher, it's on page six, Councillor Fillion's item, which is Bayview Avenue, which I believe he's just gonna release because we have the item. And then on, on the member's motion, um, which is MM 16.9, which Councillor Matlow has held down. And then the last item that we dealt with this morning is PH 13.6A, which is the, um, Housing, uh, housing and homeless on page three. Those are the items that are left. Okay, so there's a motion to finish the, um, to work right through and finish the agenda. Recorded vote. The motion to um, ex extend to complete the agenda 
carries 17 to 3. Okay. Thank you. So, so let's, let's vote on Councillor Lai's motion first. Councillor Lai, do you want a recorded vote? Okay, recorded vote. The motion carries unanimously, 20 in favor. Okay, uh, on Councillor Crawford's motion, recorded vote. Councillor Wong Tam, please. Is she watching? The motion carries unanimously, 19 in favor. Okay, Councillor Fletcher's motion. Okay, all in favor? Carried, all recorded. Councillor Thompson, when you're seated. Yes. Councillor Wong Tam, please. Councillor yes. Perjanis. Councillor Peruzza, please. The motion carries. The vote is 17 to 4. Item is amended. Oh, no, there is no amendment. It was here without recommendation. Okay, so our next item is on page 6, C, C 16.5, Bayview Avenue, Councillor Fillion. You held the item down, and I believe that we have the circulation of That's the... That's correct. So I just moved that City Council adopt the confidential instructions to staff and the confidential attachment to this motion and the direct that the instructions become public if adopted. Okay, on um, favor, carried. Okay, so our next item is member's motion, page eight, MM 16.9. Councillor Matlow, you held the item down. Um, do you have questions to staff? No? I do. You do have questions? I, indeed I do. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't see, I hear you. Okay, Councillor Matlow, questions to staff? Uh, oh, hold on, they're Mike, not here I, Mike's yet. just taking his seat. They're not here. Can't. Okay, go ahead. Great, thanks. Uh, through you, Madam uh, Speaker, uh, is a, uh, a vacant storefront tax, um, a tax that's afforded the City of Toronto through uh, the City of Toronto Act or any other provincial legislation? I'm going to direct that to the Chief Solicitor. Through you, Madam Speaker, the uh, the motion requests a report back, and we would, of course, assist the CFO and economic development in that report by providing legal advice. However, my preliminary view is that the City of Toronto Act does not permit this. Does, does not your, your amendment would be required? That is my preliminary view. I would like to look at it more closely, however. So your preliminary view is that this is not allowed uh, uh, in the City of Toronto Act. Additional um, legislative authority would be required. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my next question is, uh, does staff have any um, inventory uh, over, A, how many vacant storefronts uh, we have in the City of Toronto, and B, 
can it be parsed out as far as uh, which ones are uh, the result of um, uh, land speculators and then others that would like to have a, a, a vibrant store there but are unable to because of things like the Eglinton Crosstown construction or, or others like that? So there is no inventory of vacant uh, retail either at the uh, Main Street level or overall. There are some statistics on commercial retail, but they tend to apply to shopping centers uh, and not to Main Street retail. So there are some mechanisms that are, could be expensive or in other places they, they rely on self-reporting. Uh, and that would have to be evaluated as asked for in the motion. Uh, as to your second question, I don't have an answer for that. And again, that would have to be evaluated uh, as to whether we can easily and fairly distinguished between an Eglinton West and a, uh, uh, a speculator on North Young. Sure, sure. And then my last question is, based on that, uh, perhaps to legal, if we were able to parse it out, let's say we have uh, uh, a vacant storefront due to a speculative uh, 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 you know, land acquisition that wants to redevelop it, and then we have another storefront that you've got a You've got a, a property owner that would love to have a restaurant or a shop there, but they can't because nobody wants to go there. Can we separate them out so that if we, can we tax one and not the other? Or would the tax have to be all or nothing? Madam Speaker, uh, my view at this point is that it would be difficult to design this tax to implement it. However, that is something we would be prepared to look at with finance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Yeah, it's just a question of staff. Uh, just to follow up on Councillor Matlow. You know, the reality uh, we face today when we discuss the possibility of this tax, uh, how does it uh, fit into the reality of uh, 140 stores that are now closed on Eglinton as a result of uh, nothing that they did but what the construction has done to them? So how can we ensure that we, when we explore this, we don't uh, uh, punish these uh, people twice? I uh, completely agree with you, Councillor, and we'd have to weigh that in taking a look at, the, at what else, what has been done in other jurisdictions, because we wouldn't be the first to have this situation, unfortunately, uh, and, and come to some kind of uh, advice to Council as to whether it's possible to do that or to advise council it's not possible to do that. Is there any other mechanism that we might be able to explore beyond just this vacant tax and this uh, report that you're gonna be developing, uh, beyond this uh, tax uh, initiative that uh, is being examined? Is there any other uh, more, less punitive thing that we might be able to look at or more you know, sort of a strategic thing? So we're bringing a report uh, on what to do about just what further we can do about distressed retail uh, that's due to whatever reasons, whether it be construction or market forces, and we'll be bringing that within the next uh, six weeks uh, forward into the council process. And in that report, we outline a significant series of alternative uh, measures that can be used that are more carrot-like than they are um, uh, stick-like. So in this report that you're coming back with, you're not just narrowing in on the vacant tax as a uh, solution to the issue that the, uh, you know, Councillor Bradford is trying to deal with uh, in his end of town, which is a real issue about speculation uh, hurting uh, Main Street. So you'll be looking beyond just this uh, initiative of the vacant tax uh, process. Correct. We were already doing a major piece of work on future retail and what to do about distressed retail. Uh, <clears throat> and now we have this motion as well. So the bulk of the work is already being done and is focused on the issue that you already raised. So it, this motion would be folded into all the other work that is being done rather than you looking specifically just that this is one possible uh, solution to the problem uh, my colleague is trying to deal with in his end of town. We're looking at a much broader range of solutions than just the one that's 
in front of us at this motion. Okay, thank you. I believe this motion is asking for a report to come back. Yeah, so we're not implementing, we're just asking for a report. Councillor Holliday? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, maybe it's a forward question, but it's to staff. Um, how does one define vacant? Uh, that would be, we would look at that. Clearly, vacant is an unused store, uh, but the reason for it being unused uh, would be uh, part of the answer to your question. Do you sense that may be difficult? Sorry? Do you sense that may be a very difficult definition? Yes. Um, or do we have any models we can look to to try and establish what vacant means? Well, we would look at jurisdictions that have either in the past or currently have a, a taxation on vacant uh, retail stores. Any come to, to mind? see what they're, they're, I'm told, I don't know this from first hand, but I'm told there are a handful in the U.S. Do you think landlords may be clever and find a way to make something uh, not vacant? Uh, let's say I opened uh, Happy Holidays gift wrapping and I open up next December, but I put a table and chair in the, the vacant place and, you know, call it in business. And, and what I'm getting at is it, it may be a real difficult thing to prove something is vacant. Do, do we sense that? I agree. I'm not going to... A comment on motives and methods, sure. but uh, the difficulty I think is is real. Um, would it be fair to say that you know the the colloquial thought of what a Main Street store is, in fact, the, the zoning permissions and the real activity and what can occur on a storefront unit is quite wide. They may not necessarily be a, a store that's generally open to the public. It could be an office. It could be a, you know a charity organized. It could be a lot of different things that occur in those and. There, there may be ways to animate spaces that don't need a tax to uh, inject some life into them. I think all those things are weighed against how much the tax would be and the purpose of that. Uh, these things would all be, as, as the speaker mentioned, this is a report back and we would address those things yeah. in the report back. Thank you. Okay, I just want to remind members, like we want to finish the agenda. This is just asking for a report. Just for a report, Councillor Peruzza. Uh, yeah, I just, yeah. I just, uh, and I understand that. Now I'm hoping the yeah. report addresses all that. I just wanted to know. I, I, so remind me, uh, we used to have a, a vacancy rebate for commercial, and uh, and uh, and multi multi residential vacancies. What happened to that? We removed that. We got rid uh, of it. We removed that almost three years ago. Yeah. We removed it three years ago. Right. And remind me, why did we get rid of that? Uh, at the time, we were worried that it was an incentive to keep stores vacant. Okay. So it would be sort of looking at that and reintroducing that. In, in well, I guess in a way it would be doubling down on it, yes. Doubling down? Removing the uh, incentive, and now we're going to have a stick not to, not to do it. So it's, in effect, doubling down on it. Okay. So, so, so get rid of, the, so, so no carrot, just stick. That's what's being discussed. Okay. Okay. All right, Councillor Mallow, did you just want to move the motion? I, yeah, I have a motion. <clears throat> um, so, first of all, on the question of, of report requests, as you've heard from um, Mr. Williamson, there is already a report being prepared. This simply just validates in my motion. And they have already said that they are looking at various approaches and they are gonna report back to us. What I'm concerned about is this. You may hear that this is, only, this is also a report request. If you look at the way that this is framed, A, B, C, D, E, each item keeps referring to pursuing the question of specifically a vacant storefront tax. Now there are some, and I, I empathize with the movers' uh, motivation. I have many storefronts in Midtown Toronto that are vacant due to speculative developers who keep it like that for years. It's, it has an impact on the life and the vibrancy of the Main Street and on our communities and of the other shops in the area. It has to be addressed. But that's what Mr. Williams and his team and led by Chair Michael Thompson, is doing. By emphasizing a focus 
notice on a vacant storefront tax. This speaks in all the wrong ways to businesses like we see on Eglinton. Property owners that would love to have a shop or a restaurant. They would love it. They're not holding out. They're not, they're not, they're not just sitting there with a vacant storefront. They would love it. But nobody wants to rent there or they've lost everything and they're out of there. A vacant storefront tax is like bringing a hammer when you want to paint a wall. It's the stick that Mr. William is saying that we shouldn't be entertaining and we should be pursuing the carrots to incentivize our storefronts to be reactivated with creativity and looking at jurisdictions around the world that have figured out how to do this better than we have yet. And I look forward to reading the report, but let's not go down this road. This is essentially telling staff what we want them to focus on rather than telling us what they advise us to address as a, re as a remedy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Cole, on uh, the... Oh, sorry, I didn't see you, sorry. Okay, um, Councillor Bradford, clarification. Is there, is there anything in the motion, can we get that on the screen, please? Is there anything on the existing motion why you feel the need to delete the existing motion that would preclude us from looking at incentives? So, first of all, it is redundant because staff are already working on their report. Second of all, within the motion itself, A, looking at uh, the potential uh, for a vacant uh, store, storefront tax um, so, uh, so just hold on, to, hold on. If no, I no, no, you're not answering each, the question. Each item, well, I am, I'm, I'm answering Preclude you exactly. Preclude Hold on, uh, Councillor Bradford, with all due respect. Each item focuses, the emphasis is on discovering how to, to end up implementing a vacant storefront tax. What I'm objecting to is going in this direction, given that that's not what I'm hearing staff advising us. I, I also don't, I, I have no uh, reason to believe that you, uh, that you consulted with staff about this motion. And moreover, um, I'm concerned about property owners, businesses on Eglinton and elsewhere, seeing council move in this direction by approving a, a motion like this, and the message they will receive is that we, they, we want to start taxing uh, uh, property owners that, that have not been the reason for the challenges uh, that they're experiencing, that they're actually subject to challenges that have been imposed upon them. And not only can they not get somebody to rent their store, but now we want to tax them. So is it conceivable that staff could design a policy framework in which that's not the case? Is that conceivable? I would, if I were if I were you, I would start with asking the provincial government if they would even entertain so, uh, this question. So, but is it conceivable that staff could design a policy framework where that's not the intention? I is that hear, conceivable? I want to hear from staff if they if they believe it is. So, would they be able to articulate that in the report that specifically asked them to do they that? They would be able to articulate that in the report that they've already been writing, and you know as well as I do that they're not pursuing what you're asking them to do. What you're telling them to do is something different than what they are focusing on. So that's but you just said that they are doing this you just said that this report's actually being written but in fact that yeah clarification of the motion uh but you're saying Councilor that bradford anything uh almost anything on earth is conceivable the reality is i don't believe this so, so this is this is written in a way that allows staff to use their to use their independent objective analysis so to clarification the of the options. motion just to be clear you feel that the motion in front of you would preclude staff from looking at any incentives to support local businesses? No, I didn't. I, I didn't. I didn't say that's that. That's what, what you started with. No, what, I, what I'm what I'm saying okay, is that okay. by reading the motion, it leads and staff towards a specific destination. And your and to be clear, Councillor Bradford, I have 15 clear. seconds to be clear. You're under the impression that staff don't want to look at this. Last, question. I'm un, I'm under the impression that because that would be inaccurate. I'm under the impression that uh, it might have been more helpful for you to consult with staff on the design of this motion. Um, and I will leave staff to speak for themselves. Okay, thank you. Councillor Cole, on the motion, please. J just on this motion that we have before us. Yeah, that's the motion by Councillor Bradford, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, listen, I think this is an important uh, discussion, debate here today, because uh, I know in the past I've talked to the mayor uh, and Councillor Matlow about this whole issue of these vacant stores and 
how to uh, essentially uh, deal with them in a, in a way whereby these vacant stores uh, uh, would uh, not be hindering uh, the uh, improvement, the advancement of uh, small business areas. And that uh, for many years, like on the Danforth, there have been some stores in some parts of the different parts of the city where people bought them back in the 70s for 175,000 bucks. And so they've, and they've been getting rent uh, on them for 30, 40 years. So they don't care if they're empty right now because they've made their money uh, for the last 30, 40 years. You know, Mount Dennis and everywhere, those people bought those stores for peanuts. And now they're saying, oh, the subway is going to come. There's going to be a station there. Uh, I don't care whether it's empty. I've made my money in rent. And then uh, the, someone's going to come by, and maybe Starbucks is going to come to Mount Dennis, open up there. So I've hit the mother load. So this is the type of thing I think Councillor Bradford is trying to deal with. But you know, in the last uh, year or so, uh, it's become very acutely apparent to uh, myself, Councillor Matlow, and people in the Eglin community that there's something else happening uh, that's very, uh, uh, let's say, wide in scope and very difficult to solve. And that is, uh, as a result of infrastructure construction uh, that's sometimes done by the city, in this case, it's basically the province that's done it through uh, metro links and cross links, there has been a uh, nine year construction hell on Eglinton. Nine years. So, these, we've been trying to keep these people's spirits up. We've been trying to get them help, and getting metro links has been trying in their small way. You can't do it. You cannot survive. I don't care what you're selling, uh, unless you're Randy's Patties has been able to survive. Uh, selling the best panties in the world, but uh, if you're not Randy's, you can't survive in Eglinton. Nine years. Now we've been told, oh, another two, three, four years. Two or three, four more years they're telling us that you've got to hang on, and we've asked them for help, and they said, no. Uh, you know, Metrolinx will take care of that. Yeah, Councillor Cole, can you keep on the motion that we have. Is well, the motion request? is that but now, all of a sudden, the motion it's calls a for, for a staff report. The motion calls for an investigation into the possibility of bringing about a vacant store tax. Yes. And I think it is a very inappropriate motion at this time to bring that in because oh. it almost sends a message that the people who now have. Uh, lost their business, or may lose their business, are now going to be hit by an extra tax. So as much as we're just asking for the report, and uh, the you know, rest of council can vote for the report and wait for the whole report, I just feel that this very sensitive time when we're dealing with this 140 stores that have closed in Eglinton, I cannot even entertain looking at a vacant store tax at this time. Okay, thank you. Councillor Carroll. Yeah, just quickly, Madam Speaker, and this, this, may, this may torpedo the motion, but uh, it's, it's my day for saying could we have some faith in staff and their ability to write reports and, and create good policy. I don't see the need for a new motion. With all due respect to Councillor Matlow, in asking for a motion on a vacant store tax, does anyone honestly believe that the, the, the head of economic development for low these many years would have no regard for and make no mention of transit construction avenues? Do we really believe he would write a report and not mention that? I have total faith that I'll get a report that takes into account the number of, uh, uh, of different ways things become vacant. But on avenues where three doors down, they're getting primo rent from a Starbucks, and we've got a speculator sitting on a vacant property, who's waiting to either destroy the avenue with yet another chain, or is happy because he's making so much money from inflated residential rents upstairs that he can afford to let it just sit there forever, that kills an avenue. And retail needs our help. There are no, there, there's no doubt in my mind, um, in this entrepreneurial age of young business people, that if that uh, person adjusted their market rent to take into account what's happening in retail, 
that he'd fill those properties. Not on a transit construction avenue, of course, but there are ongoing works in that area, as we heard during budget just a week ago. And so uh, uh, I think the original motion is simply what you have said so many times, Madam Speaker, a report request. We have a couple of local councillors who need it, and I have faith in Mr. Williams to write the report they need to see. Thank, Thank you. you. So on the motion, if you put it on the screen. Oh, Councillor Bradford. Sorry. Uh, very quickly, I'll just speak to this. Um, would appreciate your support on the motion. Uh, the intent of the motion is pretty straightforward. It's asking for a report to look at this. There's a suite of policy tools that we need to, uh, to implement to support local business in Toronto. But the reality is many of our main streets are dying. And we see blocks and blocks of retail that's been boarded up, not for six months, not for the duration of a transit project, but for years and years and years because of rampant speculation. That is the intention of this motion. Uh, let me be very clear of that. And the notion that staff wouldn't be able to contemplate that or consider the complexity of transit installation on Eglinton uh, is a real discredit to them. Um, and so I'm confident in our staff team here to do a thorough look. I would certainly like to put us in line with jurisdictions like New York and Boston and San Jose and San Francisco that also face these challenges and are also being proactive and looking at this. But uh, that's what it's about. It's about being proactive and doing what we can here in the city of Toronto to support our local businesses. And I trust you'll be able to support this report request. Thank you. So if we can put the motion on the screen, please. Councillor Matlow's motion. Yes, recorded vote. Recorded vote. Councillor Matlow's motion. Councillor Holliday. Councillor Lighton, when you're seated. The motion does not carry. The vote is 5 to 16. Okay, on the motion, recorded vote. Councillor Fillion, please. Councillor Peruzza, please. The motion carries. The vote is 16 to 5. Okay. So our last item, which is on page 3, PH 13.6. Councillor Wong Tam. You held the item down. Do we have questions to staff? This is on the supplementary report. Councillor Perks. Thank you. I have some questions for the city manager. First, I just want to establish uh, what we're doing here. So this all shakes out of the big housing plan that we did. And one particular, well, no, three or four recommendations in that, that we undertake certain intergovernmental actions as part of our housing strategy. Is that through the speaker, that's correct. Okay, uh, one of the recommend one of the things council did in that uh, it was item our recommendation eighteen was to request federal and provincial representatives to meet with city staff and appropriate stakeholders before January fifteenth, twenty twenty, to develop a six month action plan. Then there were going to be reporting dates. What happened at the fifteenth meeting, and then what happened with the six month action plan? Is that memory? That's a, a correct reading of what council directed you to do? Through the speaker, I... Uh, well, through the speaker, yes. Council had asked us to form an intergovernmental work group, and the first meeting would be aimed for January 15th. It was a bit of a challenge, given that the motion happened in mid-December, December 18th, I believe. Yes. So we did meet with uh, 
provincial and federal officials. We walked them through. We provided them a copy of the council resolution as well as our housing plan, and we walked them through all the elements. Yes. Um, but we did not get members, official members from the, the federal and the provincial government until this month. Until this so, month. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. That's, those are the things I needed to know. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and, and through you, with respect to the uh, the members of the Intergovernmental Working Group, uh, you've got a representative from the uh, CMHC, you've got a representative from the Ministry of Housing, and as well as yourself, uh, uh, Madam DCM. Um, do you have everybody you need uh, at this intergovernmental working group in order to, for you to make some quick decisions, uh, to to allocate funding, to 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 enough? Is there enough political pressure uh, and energy at that particular group, given the composition, to, to achieve the outcomes? So through the speaker, we're going to our first meeting, which we're hoping to have in early March, will confirm the terms of reference, and from there. Like, we fully intend, and it's my understanding that the other governments also intend to bring other uh, senior officials to the table once we know all the issues and are, you know, that we want to tackle in order to develop the six-month action plan on housing and homelessness. And did they indicate that to you, that they plan to In bring our conversations, other? we talked okay. about augmenting the small work group with other resources. Even at the city level, I cannot do it all, so I, I will have be drawing on supports from SSHA, the Housing Secretariat, planning, et cetera. That's, that's incredibly helpful to know. And with respect to the representation from the federal government, we, are, we have an agency that's acting on be, their behalf. Is there a reason why there's no one from the federal government uh, beyond CMHC going to attend this intergovernmental working group? So we're working through CMHC to get representations from the other federal ministries as well. So there is intention to, to solicit someone who actually sits in, in, in government or at the bureaucratic level. That's correct. And with respect to the composition of the working group, um, I recognize that this has a, has a bit of a, a bureaucratic overtone to it. It's, it's, it's where we're, that's where we are. Um, but is there value in having political uh, elected representatives on this working group as well. Because what we heard at, at the committee, as you recall, at the Planning and Housing Committee, is that sometimes without the approval or the go-ahead or the support of politicians, bureaucrats tend to just perhaps not be as energetic in, in their <laughs> pursuit of those outcomes. Uh, sorry, I was trying to frame that in a way that wasn't going to come yeah, out so yeah, awkwardly. Councillor Thompson. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, and the, the Speaker has just address that perhaps she has either misspoke or just trying to find the right language. I know that the staff and bureaucrats that's been identified work super hard. They provide us with amazing results uh, on a daily basis and so on. So I would ask the speaker to retract that comment and perhaps just to find a more suitable language to be utilized because all of these folks that are in this room and beyond work tremendously hard. And I know the speaker knows that. So yeah, and, as, and, as a point of yeah, no, and something, thank, let's <laughs> make the teaching. Councillor uh, Wong Tam, could you? Um, yes, absolutely, Madam Speaker. I think as, as the words left my mouth, I was thinking I, I could have done a better job of reframing that. So I do entirely agree with uh, what Councillor uh, Thompson has just said. I think um, there was some recognition at the committee and that, uh, that things were not necessarily moving fast enough. And uh, there were speakers who were uh, who are subject matter experts who've been on the front lines advocating for a lot of additional housing and support to end homelessness, who said without political approval and, and, and defined support is that sometimes um, those at the bureaucratic level may be feeling a little bit timid to step forward. And so I just wanted to make sure that you have everyone you need at this intergovernmental working group to achieve this outcome, because you're not going to get to do this again. Through the speaker, our intent is to work with the members, the small work group, develop our terms of reference, and if I would be recommending, if I feel there's not that we need that political support, uh, to recommend that, because the direction was for the city manager to engage. So at a staff level, we engage with the staff at the federal and provincial level, but of course, we'll we will be reporting back on the terms of reference, and uh, we'll consider whether or not it would be beneficial to have a political committee, but I know that through the mayor and the deputy, um, the deputy mayor, our housing advocate, there's a lot of connections with regard to the, um, the ministers yeah. at both levels, and we would definitely keep everyone informed on how we're progressing through that work group. Thank 
Thank you. And then I have a question regarding um, out of the the uh, the uh, the housing plan and our, and our strategy to build the 40,000 units over 10 years. Um, there are a number of requests that go forward to the, both the provincial and federal government in order for the city of Toronto to achieve that outcome. Um, but we also know that in, in ending homelessness and, and trying to eliminate the social housing waitlist, which sits at 181,000, or even the supportive health list, uh, waitlist that sits at about 18,000, uh, we need to be able to do more and do it quickly. Um, so I guess the, the question for you is, um, we don't necessarily have a short-term action plan. We've got long-term strategies, but not a short-term, quick turnaround action plan. Um, is the intention to develop that out of this working group, and is there anything that can help uh, feed additional information to this working group. So uh, through the speaker, we have been asked to develop um, a shorter term plan, but we also have to keep in mind that we have longer term goals. And part of the, th one of the things I need to, I intend to talk to uh, through this working group is on a regional strategy, whether there's support for the, from the federal and the provincial government to also engage with the other um, municipalities across the region because tackling housing and homelessness only at the city of Toronto level may be a bit challenging um, because if we're the only ones uh, investing resources and developing the supports and the housing needed, um, we have added almost 4,000 beds over the past three years and yet we're still at full capacity and I am a bit concerned that the other regions have to contribute as well in order to really have and make a difference on in the, in reducing homelessness and providing adequate housing right across the region. Thank you. Okay, Council Wong, time to speak. Uh, yes, certainly, Madam Speaker, and thank you. I do have a very, um, a very long motion. I apologize for what looks like a run-on paragraph. It's really a run-on sentence, uh, but I, I do recognize that uh, the staff are doing everything they can to try to compel the other orders of government to the table. And yes, absolutely, they are probably not moving at with the same level of urgency as we would like them to, um, which is why my questions were largely to say, what more can we do to get them there? Um, my motion is to establish a City of Toronto interdivisional uh, working group, a task force, we're going to call it to end homelessness, um, and to bring together the senior divisional staff that can make the appropriate decisions and, the, and have them work in partnership with community organizations, corporate partners, and any other appropriate stakeholders, and to, to do this quickly. This, we don't need any other order of government. This is about us getting to the table with our community partners where, where, where we can actually then create um, a terms of reference, but also a six-month action plan on what does the city of Toronto need to do to define success for this intergovernmental working group. We want all that information to then feed back into this intergovernmental working group so then they know exactly what the city of Toronto needs in order for us to be successful. Um, and, uh, and so this is actually to sort of do it in two pieces. One is the intergovernmental working group is will be meeting in, in, uh, in March. They're going to set up their terms of reference. But we have actually done this before. And uh, what we've done before, which I think has been successful, is to create an interdivisional team at the city of Toronto to, uh, to uh, settle uh, the Syrian refugees. Uh, that worked incredibly well. There was a policy framework that sort of set around uh, a, a way for organizations and agencies to move together to, to get to that outcome. The appropriate decision makers at the City of Toronto at the senior divisional level was able to sort of work hand in hand with those agencies and everything seemed to move at a much quicker pace, which is probably what we need to do as well. Uh, which we have not necessarily done. We've established some long-term strategies, which are good, and we need to get them funded, and we fight for that funding every single year. And then every single year, we say to the federal and provincial government, this is how you can provide some assistance. However, if we don't define for us to, uh, locally, uh, in terms of what can be successful, I, I think we're going to, to run into some trouble. Um, and I do think that it, it will be very important to give the larger intergovernmental working group some Toronto specific requirements and, and, and allocation requests. So they would then uh, be able to hopefully replicate what I believe was a very successful model with the Syrian refugee resettlement program that was entirely 
made in Toronto by Torontonians uh, for the community that we welcomed uh, with open arms. And, uh, and I think that the settlement agencies that came to the table by way of inter um, invitation by the City of Toronto really appreciated that level of leadership. So it's been done before. Now I think we need to turn our attention to bringing in a different group of community partners, including uh, corporate partners and those appropriate stakeholders that could probably um, drive up the, the, the request for number one, uh, the housing allowances, uh, which is really what we need at the end of the day, uh, because the market has, has outpaced the actual uh, ability for people to pay. So people are, are teetering on homelessness or perhaps they're, they're already in, in some type of precarious state of homelessness and they cannot get their foot back into the housing market and they don't need supportive housing. They just need an additional robust uh, housing allowance and they need us to help coordinate that. And we need to be able to provide some supports to the private sector to encourage them to actually to rent to people who perhaps income qualifications don't meet that benchmark, but if they know that they are being sort of supported by, by the uh, city governments, uh, plus all these agencies that will, will be there to, to make this work go forward, um, we could probably uh, replicate that success that we've seen with the Syrian refugee settlement program. Uh, and that is, Madam Speaker, what I'm hoping this motion will do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perks to speak. Thank you, Speaker. I have a motion as well. The City Council declare homelessness in Toronto an emergency. City Council direct the City Manager to immediately establish a formal city-led homeless emergency task force table composed of elected representatives from all three levels of government to meet by the end of March 2020 to determine an immediate six-month action plan and strategy framework. And three, City Council requests Mayor Tory to provide a public update on the outcomes immediately following the meeting in part two above. So let me explain what these mean and why I'm doing them. First, we have had a number of discussions at committee and council about whether or not we should declare housing as an emergency. I want to tell you what I mean. Most Fridays, you can find me in the basement of the Parkdale Library doing constituency meetings. Over the last decade, increasingly, the people who are coming to see me are at risk of losing their homes. Last Friday, a woman came to see me, and she was currently staying in a shelter, but she had several months ago applied as for a priority placement in housing because she was fleeing domestic abuse. The problem is there were a few questions about her paperwork, but when city staff tried to contact her, she was at that time homeless, so they couldn't find her, so her application stopped and now it has to start all over again. That is an emergency. And that story is not unique to her. I know this, I work with this every day, Councillor Wong Tam does, the advocates who came when we had our housing plan know that this is not a unique story. This is a story with thousands of variations. This is why thousands of people, our brothers and sisters, will be without homes tonight they will be without homes tomorrow night. They will be without homes the next night. And if we don't do something, they will be, out, out of, they will be without homes 20 years from now. I picked that date because 20 years from now is when the city of Toronto said that homelessness was a disaster. Now, the second parts of my motion. When we were debating the housing plan, housing activists came to us and said, you must treat this as more urgent than you are treating it. You have to recognize that this is the kind of thing that we have to face the way we faced when the province was about to cut public health funding. We had petitions, we had robocalls. The mayor knocked on doors in conservative ridings in the city of Toronto. We are at that point with housing. And they wanted us to act. Councillor Wong Tam and I and other members of the Housing Committee, Councillor Bailao and the mayor's staff tried to find language which would make something happen. And we settled on the idea that within a month, there would be a political table and that they, we would get a report back in February. That's the report we have now saying, what happened at that political table to solve this problem? Do you have that report? You do not. What you have is a proposal for some members of the public service 
to begin a conversation and tell us something in six months. That is not what you do in an emergency. It's not what you do when rail lines are blocked. It's not what you do when the coronavirus is happening. It's not what you do when our public health system is at risk. It's what you do when you're grinding away at a problem that takes a long time to solve. True, and that's good, and they should do that work, and I'm not opposed to it. But what I am saying is that you and I all know that there are things we could do tomorrow that if the mayor, the premier, and the prime minister, or some cabinet ministers came and sat in Toronto with cameras outside, went into the room with the expectation they would have to come out of the room and tell the cameras what the plan was. That's what my motion calls for. That is very different from asking members of the public service, whose work I believe in and treasure, to begin a six-month table. That is saying that the woman I saw on Friday has real needs and that they need to be dealt with now. We know this, this isn't inventing something new. It's not building a spaceship. We know that if we had more money for housing supports tomorrow from, from the federal government, we could house more people. We know that if in, instead of, as is rumored, cutting ODSP rates, the province increased them, more people would be housed. We know that those commitments could be made, even if you have to point at an empty chair and say, where's the premier, if we escalate this to a political fight that is about an emergency. Thank you. Councillor Bylaw, did you want to speak? You got your name. Oh, Pardon? I just want a clarification of the motion. Oh, you want a question? Okay. Yes. Uh, just a sec. Clarification? Just on the point one to declare yes. an emergency. Are, yes. there's, we've I know there's gone all around kinds. This. I deliberately did not put in, as defined in the federal legislation or the provincial legislation, I want it to be a statement that this group of people who are elected to serve Torontonians yeah. include in the people that we are serving those who are currently homeless and we understand that the circumstance they are facing is an emergency. So how is this different from what we've done in December? This, uh, what? What, the way it is different, Councillor Bailao, is we instructed city staff to do a whole bunch of things no, 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 but that, we, that we would, did, if I could finish, we record, that, if I could finish, you asked me a question, your, I am answering your answer. question. You asked me how it is different. How it is different is that I am bundling together the things that called for urgent action in a more focused way by saying I want elected representatives to deal with the fact that it is an emergency. I get that part. Right. I was trying to understand the, the I think it's important we pass I these things together so that the Premier of Ontario and the Prime Minister of Canada understand that this council wants them in the city or cabinet ministers to deal with what we call an emergency. That's why I've grouped these three as one motion. Okay. Okay? Not because they haven't been done. You heard my answer, Councillor. Okay, are there any further speakers? Um, Mayor Tory. Yes, uh, Madam Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I should say that I'm going to support uh, Councillor Wong Tam's uh, motion, which I think is a constructive uh, way in which we can, I, I think, to be candid, uh, Madam Speaker, I think some of this work is being done at present by our officials and, uh, and not just on a, uh, a basis right now, but it's done on an ongoing basis to try and continuously, interdivisionally, uh, find more ways in which we can be uh, of greater help. Uh, but having said all that, I don't think there's a, any harm in looking at it in the way that was set out in her motion, uh, interdivisionally, uh, in a kind of real combined effort to make sure we have all hands on deck and have a date, which I believe was April uh, 2020, to hear back. Um, I will not be supporting uh, Councillor Perk's motion. I think it is, um, I, I just say with respect, Madam Speaker, I'm not sure what to say about it, except to say that it is yet one more uh, coming forward um, uh, of what I think is a highly, uh, uh, a highly politicizing way in which to try to um, uh, 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 put this issue into the news as opposed to actually doing anything about it. I mean, the fact is, Councillor Perks, Madam Speaker, um, voted for, as did all of us, because it was a unanimous vote, the establishment not of a political table, I would point out, of an intergovernmental table. And the composition of that wasn't actually specified, but the, the, the intention, I think, or the wish of the parties involved was that we should get people around the table 
And I don't know, I'm not aware of any representations he's made whatsoever, but I can say in my own case, in the case of the deputy mayor, in the case of our city officials, we dealt with and we dealt with and we dealt with getting the three governments to agree to appoint these representatives who are very senior people, the assistant deputy minister of housing, a senior person from CMHC and so on, to sit down and do this work. And, and I think just like several other successful negotiations that we have undertaken in this area, this is the right place to start with our professional public servants. I think the suggestion that is made here that there was an inadequate sense of urgency about this is completely unfair uh, in that the motion, as was pointed out earlier on by somebody, was passed on the 18th of December. And here we are, it is, yes, into February. And they're going to have a meeting right away. And I think our deputy city manager, with the greatest of respect, Madam Speaker, is totally seized of the urgency of this matter. Uh, we are, we've gone through so many times this business of the declaration of an emergency, no matter whether it's statutorily based or otherwise. We passed a motion with the support of the member who's now moving another emergency motion that said, City Council recognized this homelessness in Toronto as an ongoing critical and emergency issue, requiring the provincial and federal governments to commit on an expedited basis, and so on. And that is precisely the work that is being done. And I would pose this question, Madam Speaker, and I know I'm not supposed to speak directly to the member, so I'll speak through you and just say, I would like to see a catalog, a list, of exactly how many meetings the member has had in Ottawa with the Government of Canada or anybody there, including the opposition for that matter, or at Queen's Park with anybody up there, including the opposition, to advance this case. Because I can tell you, I have a lengthy roster of meetings in which I'm doing that as the mayor of the city to precisely bring them to the table to do precisely the kinds of things the member is speaking about, which is to increase their support, to embark on programs to build supportive housing and finance the, uh, the staffing of it, and so on and so forth. I could go on at the length of the number of meetings since December the 18th. And I'd like to see the equivalent list that the member has when he's here telling us what an emergency this is. And so I would say that the, 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 I, I find a much more constructive approach uh, to the, appro the, the motion of Councillor Wong Tam, which will put our divisional people together, our hardworking professional public servants. They will come back uh, to us with some recommendations. I know it seems like a long time away in April, but again, um, I, think, I, I, I think if they had some measures that they wanted to bring forward that very same professional public service who I meet with week in and week out uh, on this very matter, uh, and there is no matter that concerns me more uh, than trying to find an answer to this, but what I will not do is play politics with it and politicize it in this manner and, 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 and pretend to the people that it, by having a meeting tomorrow morning um, that would consist of politicians that somehow everybody was going to say, aha, we have the magic solution here, we know exactly what we're going to do. And I would point out as well that, because I know a lot of this started with rhetoric this morning about, about the encampments, and I would point out that I have here an article from 2006, and, and there was all manner of removal for public safety and for public health and for sensitivity reasons of encampments taking place at that time. Uh, I suspect they were not subject to the same kind of process that is in place today to be a sensitive and to work hard to address the housing needs of the people that are affected by that. Nobody wants the encampments. Nobody wants the encampments to have to be removed. We don't want them to exist. But I do think that these governments are now beginning to work together better than they were before uh, to address precisely that question, which, as we know, is, is going to be solved by affordable housing, uh, being built like it is never before. And again, I know it aggravates the member in particular when I mention this, but if you look back at the days before I was here, when he was here, Madam Speaker, and you look at how many affordable housing units were built in each of those years, it paled by comparison to what this council is doing now, and the same right down the list uh, on all that stuff. So we're doing more now. It's not enough, but we're going to do more. But this committee that is suggested to be established and now has been agreed to finally by all three governments at the behest of this city council is going to sit down and start to do this work without political theatre. That's why there aren't politicians there. So that and the politicians will be able to act in due course. Thank you. Councillor Perks. Yeah, question the mayor. Yeah. So, you know, we'll, we'll play trade the calendar some other day. Perhaps one day when you actually come to the homeless memorial, we can play. Councillor Perks. I'd be happy to do that. Councillor uh, Perks, you know, please. Maybe, if you maybe have at a the question. housing. Maybe Councillor at the Perks, housing if you have a question, please ask. Yeah, the no, question. the mayor wanted to engage, so I engaged. Um, so, are you aware that when we were uh, drafting recommendation 18 of the housing report that we passed, as you said, in December, that the members of the Planning and Housing Committee, myself, Councillor Wong Tam, worked with Councillor Bailao and your office to craft that motion? Are you aware of that? Yes. Are you aware that the conversation we had with Councillor Bailao and your staff explicitly said that this would include political leadership? I was not. Ah, you might want to check with your staff on that. 
Can you explain to me why it is political theater when we ask for politicians to step forward on the issue of homelessness, but it is not political theater when you're knocking on doors about a budget matter? I would just say respectfully through you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Councillor, please, to, to the item. This is the item that the mayor specifically okay use the yeah. phrase, I'm specifically asking about that, I am on the item and I would appreciate not being interrupted. And uh, Madam Speaker, uh, what I'll say through you to the member is that uh, we have been over this uh, matter of uh, using the word emergency and, and, I, and, and, and I voted for the motion as did you that said this is an emergency and critical situation or the wording and the emergency, critical and emergency issue. Oh, I, uh, I, I all asked the question. I, sorry, I didn't okay. interrupt sorry. you. Now, yep. Councillor, please allow the mayor to answer. Sure. Okay, Mr. Mayor. So we worked hard, and this is the way, you see, this is the way, obviously, Madam Speaker, some people have more trouble working this way than others, but when we passed that motion, and when we actually put in place some of the actions that were undertaken in the last couple of years under the, the leadership of this council to address what is a very serious issue, a, a critical and emergency issue facing the city, we did it through collaboration. And, and today, I would argue, when I use the expression political theater, this is simply a member of council uh, getting up and deciding one more time to use this word emergency, which won't house a single homeless person. It won't help the woman that you talked about, uh, you know, uh, who, who I have great sympathy for, and I'd be happy to try and help her myself. It won't fix the systemic problem that led to the paperwork somehow going uh, other places. And that's the point I'm making, which is this is theater sometimes that goes on in here. That meeting that is going to happen among those officials, I believe, because they know how urgent we think this is, they agreed on, on representations from the Deputy Mayor, myself, and others to come to the table. By the way, this is our initiative to do this, and they said yes. Thank you. And of course, you're so, not willing to leave that alone. So, you want, you so want to now have some I other... I was actually not adjectives. asking about the emergency part. You made the accusation that I was doing just theatre by saying politicians having a meeting. Can you tell me why it is theatre for politicians to have a meeting when thousands of Torontonians are sleeping on the street tonight, but it is not theater for you to knock on doors in Tory-held parts of the city during a budget argument. I, I'm not sure, Madam Speaker, what, what happened during that episode has anything to do with what's going on today. I see. And I will say that I think that that circumstance we faced was in response to a budget that happened right at that time, whereas this is one of multiple times that people have come in here, uh, Madam Speaker, and moved motions using the word emergency, uh, I think, uh, look, to draw attention to this, which is fine, I acknowledge, I've acknowledged many times that this is a very serious issue, but I think what people want us to do about it is not uh, make speeches in here about it, they want us to act. We've had a major step forward with the agreement by the other two governments to sit at this uh, table under the leadership of our very capable Deputy City Manager, whose integrity and uh, determination I'm sure you don't question, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to their work, and I'm looking forward to uh, some of the fruits uh, being born of the meetings that I've had in Ottawa, and I would be very interested in perhaps you publishing your calendar of all the meetings you've had in Ottawa, urging the federal government to do the things that you talked about just a couple of minutes ago through you, Madam Speaker. Okay, so if you don't see the relationship to that instance, can you tell me why it is political theater to have a meeting of heads of government or cabinet ministers on this issue, but it is not political theater for you to appear in front of microphones with the Minister of Transportation on the issue of transit? I will only say- what, Where is the line I will, I will where only... you speaking and you speaking with Councilor other Parks? orders of government is theater and, and not. Where is that line? You do it all the time. Why is this one theater and all the other times you do it not? Councillor well, Perks. Well, I'll perhaps answer a different question, Madam Speaker, and simply yeah. say that uh, through you, that uh, if, when it's all you do is to come in here and move motions about, uh, about different things and using words that are used over and over again, as opposed to the work that I try to do very, very, on a very diligent basis and a repeated basis and a consistent basis in Ottawa and at Queen's Park, then maybe I think it is possible to, uh, to look at it slightly differently than the work that I do day in and day out uh, and that I would be pleased to be joined uh, by some other members of council, as I have been with some of them, but I, I haven't uh, noticed as I say, that calendar that you make reference to, and I'll certainly look forward to you publishing a long list over the last five years of the constructive meetings you've had with ministers of the other governments uh, to advance the case that you advance in here uh, in front of the media. Thank you. Um, Councillor Thompson, you have a question to the Mayor. Uh, yes, I do, Madam Speaker. Um, through you, Speaker, uh, Mayor Tory, um, you would agree that uh, homelessness um, in the City of Toronto and across this country is a major issue? 
it's a huge issue, and you mentioned across the country and in the city, and I would add regionally, because in the end, what's happening is that the regional homeless problem is one that is being laid at our doorstep, and we're not getting any help with that. And that's another thing that I've been making representations on publicly and privately. Uh, but it is a very serious issue. In fact, I was one of those, together with you, Deputy Mayor, and through you, Madam Speaker, that said in a motion we just passed uh, at the end of last year that it was an ongoing, critical, and emergency issue. The um, report here seeks to continue to address this through the intergovernmental um, uh, committee of, of staff members who are the ones structurally doing the framing and bringing forward ideas and recommendations. At some points, politicians will be involved in terms of the actual implementation of the work that would be done, but it's much more constructive that they're the ones actually doing the work, and that's essentially the point that you'd like to see that's what we're driving home, is that correct? I, yeah, uh, Madam Speaker, I would agree with the Deputy Mayor and say that, uh, that uh, my experience has been here that uh, my energies and the energies of other members of Council are best devoted at the beginning of, of, a, of an intergovernmental process like this at getting the process together as opposed to constituting the membership of the committee. And so I think it was a major step forward and it took not just a little bit of uh, persuasion and, and uh, work to get the other governments to the table so that we could come here today and say this committee would consist of senior representatives of the other government and of our own government. And so I think that is a significant step forward. We will see what comes from that exercise. But I think it is a constructive, uh, appropriate way to rely on our professional public service and those of the other two governments uh, to move this issue forward, as was, by the way, contemplated by the very motion passed by this city council here to initiate this in December. entire process. In the motion that was passed in December. Yes, that's, that's the one. So um, can I then ask you and, and turn your attention to the thought that, um, and I don't have the member's motion in front of me, but if the member's motion was in front of me, I'd ask you the question with respect to the, 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 the necessity or the action to declare an emergency. What, from your particular perspective, would be done that's not already being done today? Well, this is a part of the point that I've been trying to make, and perhaps inadequately through you, Madam Speaker, to the uh, Deputy Mayor, which is that uh, we put the wording in that we did, which was recognizing and was by consensus and by collaboration, uh, that we put that wording in to say it was a critical and emergency issue. And uh, as I said earlier on, if I thought that the uh, declaration of an emergency as contemplated by this motion was going to advance the interests of one homeless person or get one affordable housing unit built faster or one more supportive uh, housing unit established, I'd much rather be working on, quite frankly, some of the things that I was talking with Deputy Mayor Bilo about just this morning, where we're in discussion with the very same provincial government about moving ahead with some supportive housing, rather than what I did call, and people can criticize me if they wish, the political theater coming in here and throwing words around it as if that's going to house a homeless person, because it's not. Um, it's the hard work that we've been doing, and I would say that I stood up first today and said I would vote for the motion that Councillor Wong Tam brought, which to me is a much more constructive companion to the intergovernmental committee that we would have one inside, interdivisionally inside of our own city, to bring back a report contemporaneously to say, okay, the governments have agreed to do these things together, and our city government has agreed we could do a better job by doing that. That, to me, is a constructive uh, approach, and that's why I'm going to vote for it. The other approach here, I believe, is not, uh, not, not as helpful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, so if we can put the motions on the screen. Councillor Wong Tam's motion. Okay. On favor? Carried. Okay. Next motion. Okay, recorded vote. Councillor Carroll, please. The motion does not carry. The vote is 7 to 15. Okay, so that was the item. All right. Councillor Peruzza. There you go. Oh, okay, hold on. Uh, members, before I ask for motion to enact the general bills, may I have a motion regarding the consideration of submissions on zoning bylaw and official plan amendments? Councillor Peruzza, you have a motion? 
Yeah, thank you, Speaker. I don't think I've ever had been handed one of these, so I'm happy to read it. <laughs> that committee and council considered submissions in making a decision on zoning bylaw and official plan amendments. And to this, I would like to affix my signature, Madam Speaker. Okay. Councillor Perks, you have a motion. To oh, on favor? <laughs> Carry. <laughs> Councillor Perks, you have a motion to introduce certain bills. Yes, I move that leave be granted to introduce bills. Uh oh. 201 to 240. Shall Lee be granted to introduce these bills? Recorded vote. Deputy Mayor Minna Wong, please. Motion to introduce the bills carries unanimously. 22 in favor. Shall these bills be passed and declared as a bylaw? Recorded vote. Councillor Cole, please. Councillor Peruzza, please. Motion to enact the bills carries unanimously, unanimously 22 in favor. Councillor Fletcher, you have a motion regarding absentees. Yes, so Speaker, I uh, move that City Council excuse the absence of Councillor Jay Robinson and Councillor James Pasternak from the February 26, 2020 City Council meeting. Thank you. All those in favor, recorded vote. Councillor Peruzza, please. The motion to excuse absentees carries unanimously. 22 in favor. Councillor Wong Tam, you have a motion to introduce the confirming bill? Uh, yes, I do, Madam Speaker. That leave be granted to introduce a bill to confirm to the point of the introduction of this motion the proceedings of City Council Meeting 16 on February 26, 2020. Shall leave be granted to introduce this bill? Recorded vote. Councillor Bradford, please. Can't. The motion to, to introduce the confirming bill carries unanimously, 22 in favor. Shall this bill be passed and declared as a bylaw? Recorded vote. Councillor Kerjanis, please. The motion to enact the confirming bylaw carries unanimously, 22 in favor. Okay, thank you. Meeting is adjourned.